skinny as me. I said, damn, weight cuts is real, ain't they? <laughs> oh, man. Let me turn my phone off. Make sure they get no more questions. We are now joined by number 10 ranked USC middleweight Kevin Holland. Kevin, thank you very much for joining us today. No, thank you. We'll take our first questions from Sumik Dada with Sports Kita. Your line is open. Hey, Kevin. It's good to talk to you once again. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing well. I'm good. Thank you. So, right off the bat, how does it feel to finally get added to the UFC game? Oh, man, it feels good. You know what I mean? Kid like me coming to where I come from, you only get in the video game if you, uh, you know, create a character or if you uh, join the NBA or the NFL. I got a character all busting people across their head. That feels good. Now, moving on to the fight this weekend and everything that's going on in the middle of the division right now. I don't know if you came across this, but Israel Adesanya said yesterday in an interview that you still have a long way to go before getting that title shot, even if you're victorious this Saturday against Derek Brunson. Do you have any response to that comment from the champion, knowing that you'll be on a six-fight win streak this weekend? From the who? You said the, the what? The ex-champ? He just went and lost his last fight. He ain't the champ. Right now, as far as I'm concerned, his opinion doesn't really matter. You know, I have uh, uh, the longer winning streak. He's coming off a loss. You know, I guess they could say that was at 205, but in my eyes, a fight is a fight. Weight class doesn't matter. You know, go watch my Instagram video. I used to show change inside my cups in order to go up a weight class. This is nothing new to me. I'm true to this. Fuck us, Anya. So do you think that the, that the title fight should be the one after this fight? Yeah, I'm fighting Kamaru Usman for the, for the welterweight belt after this fight. Fair enough. Okay, and speaking of the fight this weekend, uh, there is obviously a massive gap in octagon competition between you and Brunson from last year. He fought once, which was a three-round main event, whereas you had five fights in 2020. Do you feel that's something that might play a factor to your advantage this weekend? Uh, no, nah, last year was last year, and this year is this year. So it's a whole new year, a whole new ball game, a whole new situation. Uh, last year I was hot and ready. This year we'll see if I'm still hot and ready. So uh, if the hand's still hot, then he will drop. So we'll see. You also mentioned yesterday you weren't a fan of fighting the whole 25 minutes. That being said, could we expect another quick knockout from you this Saturday? Hey, man, I'll take what they give me. If a quick knockout happens, I will be happy. If a quick submission happens, I will be happy. I don't plan on, uh, I don't plan on being there for 25 minutes. You know, it's like uh, by the time we start fighting, it'll be close to 10 o'clock at night. And uh, in Texas, that's 12. That's close to my bedtime. So I got to get them in there and get them out. Also, uh, one other thing you mentioned yesterday that you were willing to step into that April 17th card, uh, which Paulo Costa withdrew from. I'm just curious that would you still be down to fighting Robert Whitaker after all this is said and done, you know, down the road at some point? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure Robert Whitaker, if he gets past Kevin Gastelum, he'll be fighting for the belt, you know, and he'll become the official champ. But, uh, no, I'm down to fight whoever, whenever, however, it doesn't really matter to me. I can pull up in this room right now. We can scrap as long as I still get my check. I'm good. Now, uh, before I let you go, you obviously had five fights in uh, 2020. You're the active throughout the entire year almost. Do you have a number in mind for this year? I'm just trying to beat that record. They say five is a record, so if I can get it with six, I'll be happy. Honestly, if they count this fight as a calendar year and that's six, then that's awesome. Uh, I'm just trying to break that, that record. You know, it's like I feel like it's an easy record to break. Six fights in one year, seven fights in one year, eight fights in one year. I mean, I could do that. That wouldn't be a problem. I've done it before, you know. All right, uh, we look forward to fighting uh, to your fight this weekend, and thank you for your time, Kevin. Thank you. We will take our next questions from Hunter with MMA Weekly. Your line is open. Hey, Kevin, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. How you doing? Doing good. How about you? Um, in 2018, I believe it was after your scrap with uh, Tiago Santos, Derek Brunson actually complimented you, saying you were here to stay on Twitter, and you even responded by thanking him. Did you think back then in 2018 you guys could be potentially competing against one another, despite the kind words? Yeah, so that was my manager that responded to him on Twitter. Uh, I don't run my Twitter. I've never even touched my Twitter before a day in my life. Every once in a while, he'll show me what's going on there, and I'll be like, man, you're doing a great job. Uh, but... You know, 2018, I would have told him thank you, just like I would tell him thank you now. You know what I mean? It's just a respectful part of me. Uh, but that being said, in 2018, when I got in the UFC, after losing to Thiago Santos, I told my manager, I was like, if we're staying at 185 pounds, Derek Brunson's on the hit list. So here we are, 2021, Derek Brunson's here, I'm here, and he's for sure on the hit list. So now I just got to go hit him. Um, What was it like going on the Joe Rogan experience with uh, Travis? Ah, uh, man, dreams do come true. It was, uh, it was super amazing. You know, first... Uh, just 
first show me and my mom ever watched together and I willingly watched besides Lifetime was Joe Rogan, uh, Fear Factor. So being able to go on the Joe Rogan podcast to me was amazing. You know, it's like my transmission broke on the way there. Had he said it was a Fear Factor, uh, um, what do you say? How do you say it if you're trying to get into something like a, a um, I don't know. If he, if he said it was like something to, to, to prove that I could be a part of Fear Factor, I would have drove my whole car there backwards the whole fucking time. You know? <laughs> I love Joe Rogan, so. Yeah, I'm glad I made that. That was amazing. Yeah, right on. Um, have you thought about what you might want next with the victory over Derek on Saturday, or are you just solely focused on the task at hand? I'm definitely focused on the task at hand, but, you know, victory over Derek Brunson, I keep telling everybody, everybody probably thinks I'm playing. I'm going to go down to 170 pounds and fight Kamaru Usman for the belt or George Mazadoff for his BMF belt, one or the other. Um, it's like it'd be a picture-perfect road. I'll do George Mazadoff at a catch weight, then I'll do Usman at 170. And it's like I – Woke up today at 188 pounds. I ain't cutting no weight for this fight. Life is easy. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, we know that uh, you're capable of going down to 170. Have you thought about potentially maybe the winner of uh, Whitaker and Kelvin Gastelum? Uh, I mean, if the winner of Kelvin Gastelum and Whitaker is Whitaker, then um, Whitaker should be fighting for the title. Hell, I feel like Whitaker low-key should be fighting for the title now, but unfinished business between him and Kelvin Gastelum makes sense. Uh, winner of that fight should be fighting for the title. Um... Well, 85 division is really in a weird situation. Uh, had the champ won the 205 belt and decided to stay at 205. Uh, you know, like he said, the, the division would be snagged, stagnant, like he said about John Jones at 205. So right now I feel like it's kind of stagnant. I would like to create some buzz at 170 and then come back up to 85. That's really what the goal is. Create For some sure. Buzz, come back. That way it's not so stagnant and that way it's not so, uh, you know, same people doing the same thing. And uh, with uh, the quote-unquote ex-champ since he's coming off a loss, saying that I don't deserve a title fight right after this one makes sense. He's not doing anything but re repeating what I told him last year when we seen each other. I told him I had like four or five more wins before I could see him. I just um, want to see him. I want to make sure I take him out. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Um, uh, do you have any more to give us uh, regarding that exchange you just had with Derek Brunson before you came on here? No, I was just telling him, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't understand why you ain't been responding to my DMs all week. Uh, you know, you said it was no hard feelings, so I don't understand why you ain't responding to me. You know what I mean? We're both here to get paid. So, you know, I figured the two people who was going to make the money would have a good conversation with each other before the fight. But I just don't think he wants to play my mental warfare. You know, it's like uh, I just want to have a good casual conversation right now and in the cage. He doesn't want to have one at all. So we'll just have one inside the cage. He talked to me a little bit when we were when we were doing He He opened his mouth a little bit. And I can tell you right now, that's one thing his coaches probably didn't want him to do. So since he's down to talk now, he'll be down to talk then. <laughs> Appreciate the time, Kevin. Good luck on Saturday. No, thank you. We'll go next to Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Kevin, how are you? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good, man. I want to ask you about being on your first UFC poster. What did you think about uh, just the picture they chose of you just kind of screaming and Derek being chill? Ah, it's it's perfect. Honestly, it's perfect. Um, perfect for me, not perfect for Brunson. Brunson has been chill his last two fights, so that's pretty cool, but... You know, when you piss that guy off, he comes in, no blah, 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 big old lips, like freaking bubble off Forrest Gump, charging in with his head for it. So uh, it's a good poster for me, bad poster for him, but it's my second poster. My first poster was against Jack Hermanson, even though the fight didn't happen. So first real poster, second poster with the UFC, but it's amazing. I love it. I'm enjoying it very, very much so. After the year you had, all the bonuses, I mean, do you still have things you need for the green machine, or have you moved on to a new project? I mean, old school cars, you can always switch it up. Old school cars, you never really have to have a new project, but I do have a few new projects. Um, I like the Green Machine, truly do like the Green Machine. I think it's an amazing car. I'm still trying to figure out the transmission exactly how it needs to go. Um, I think the shift, I think the, the, the shifter cable on there is a little off. So, I mean, we'll see. You know, Green Machine still has plenty of work to be done with it. You know, these old school cars, you can easily put over 100 grand into them. So I'll easily put over 100 grand into every single one of my old school cars. Kevin, what's your fight week routine? Because obviously at the Apex, let's be honest, you've done the process more than anybody else. So what is your routine by now? You have to have it down. Uh, I don't really have a routine. You know, we just pull up, do a little shakeout. You know, you're on lockdown. So then you go the next day, you know, I go to the PI, have a little fun there. Next day, I go to the PI, have a little fun there. And then it's way in, then it's fight time. Uh, there's not very much to do. Me and my coach may play dominoes. He brings his PlayStation. We may play 2K. Um, we talk shit. I'm on the phone a whole lot, and I sleep a lot more. So uh, it's really just chill. And I do a whole bunch of videos in my little pinky ring and show the diamonds dancing. So it's it's really nothing too much to do but chill. 
<laughs> you know, as you get these bigger fights, keeping that active schedule is going to be a little bit harder. I think you know that. Does it bother you that you may not be able to get those, you know, hit that five, six fight mark if it keeps going well for you? Or does the extra money, you know, it just makes it all good? I'll retire and I'll just transfer over to another sport. Therefore, I can continue to fight as much as I want to. I'm just playing. Uh, we'll figure it out. You know what I mean? It's like uh, there's always welterweight, you know, and there's always uh, taking crazy fights at 205. We'll figure out the schedule. We'll stay active, though. Uh, just one quick one about Derek. On this three-fight win streak he's on, do you feel like he's a particularly different fighter than when he was going a little bit up and down with the losses? Yeah, I feel like I feel like um, the move that he has made with Henry Hoof has made him definitely, definitely a better uh, fighter. Striking looks a lot better. He seems a lot more calm when he's in there. And, um, yeah, I think it's amazing. But that also being said, I don't think he's been emotional during any of his fights lately. So if you can get him a little bit emotional, you might not see the same Derek Brunson you've seen in the past three fights. You might see the Derek Brunson you've seen who was going up and down with the fight. You know? Ed. And that even being said, going up and down with the fights, people say that like Derek Brunson has lost to bad people. He's only lost to really, really good people. You know? So that being said, it's time to find out how really, really good I am. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Good luck. Thank you. We'll go next to Omer Mert with Esport. Your line is open. Hello, Kevin. How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? Good. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, Alessandro tried light weight but failed. If you get the belt, do you want to try light weight? Same thing? you saying like go up a weight class? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm down to go to any weight class that I can make it to. Um, you guys, I think you guys don't really understand what I say when I say I came in, I woke up today at 188 pounds. I got here at 192, 194 pounds. I'm a light guy. I'm already doing what Israel Sanya tried to do against John Bloktovich every time I step in here at 85. You guys just don't notice it because of my frame. Uh, now, if I was fighting at 70 this whole time, you guys would be like, oh, my God, now he's coming up to 85. That's a big jump, right? No, uh, just don't get caught up on the hype so much. That's, that's you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I don't want to be an asshole. <laughs> Give me another question. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Another question. Adesanya and his coach insist uh, he wants the Darren Till. What do you think about this? Is Darren Till is a contender? Look, I'm going to tell you what I feel about Israel Sanya, and then you can ask me other questions besides Israel Sanya. All right? I okay. think Israel Sanya has a titty, and he was doing steroids to get that titty. All right? Next question. Okay, not more I, I, Hey, Adesanya. guys, I don't want to talk about Israel Sanya. You know what I mean? It's like okay. you guys always want to talk about Israel Sanya, and it's like uh, he just lost. You know what I mean? He just lost a fight where he got beat up on the feet. He's supposed to be the best striker in, 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 the, in the sport. Uh, and then he got taken down and beat up there. You guys don't talk about that, but you guys talk about him stepping up a weight class and doing this, him doing this, him doing that. It's like then everybody's going to view me as the bad guy because I'm up here telling you guys you guys are fucking nuts for riding his dick so damn hard. Stop riding his dick so hard. Okay, another question from the fighting. You mentioned 2K. Which team do you choose the most? And do you have another, uh, any favorite team in the NBA? Do I have any what? Say it again one more time, please. You mentioned 2K games. Uh, which team do you choose the most? And do you have a favorite team in the NBA? Oh, yeah. Uh, NBA, I choose the Lakers over everybody. Um... I didn't understand what the first one was, but Lakers all day, every day. That's my number one team, for sure. Always will okay. be. Always. Always. Forever. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the same questions, Kevin. You're Good okay. On Saturday. Just, it's okay. It's okay, bro. I don't mean to be an asshole. It's just, you know, everybody wants to talk about Israel Sanya, you know, and he's coming off a loss. Nobody talks about that. They just talk about him like he's some type of god or something, and he's not. Okay. Good luck, man. Thank you. Good luck to you, too. We'll go next to Augusto Nias Gay with Somos MMA. Your line is open. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm fine. Thank you. Kevin, you've said yesterday that you prefer to fight 15 minutes instead of, instead of 25, and that UFC can make you the quote-unquote co-main champ. So I want to know, if you would have to choose someone from the division to be a contender for that title, who would it be? Who, who do you think deserves it, apart from you, of course? Man, uh, the co-main champ who doesn't want to go 25 minutes? There's only one person in the world who doesn't want to go 25 minutes besides me, and that's probably, you know, Derek Lewis. Uh, if you're talking about <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, 
man, it's like a lot of those guys like the idea of just sitting there looking at each other for 25 minutes. I hate that. I want to fight hard for 15 and go home. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So Derek Lewis is the 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 current um, the current uh, aspirant to the, to the champ. I mean the um, the runner up. Yeah, nah, Derek Lewis is he's not the runner up. He's the man. You know what I mean? I'm the runner oh, up. Okay. Derek Lewis is the man. I'm the runner up. <laughs> okay, okay. And Kevin, I have seen you in, on your Instagram stories that yesterday you were signing the the official posters. So I I, I want to ask you. Why did you choose that particular spot for your signature? And I am talking about the, the, the Bronson's forehead. Uh, I mean, were you trying to get into his head literally this time or not? Nah, you know, uh, X marks the target. No, nah, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got in there and I looked over to the side and somebody had signed like right on my mouth. And I was like, oh, really? We're playing this game. So then I just started signing on the man's forehead. You know, it was just part of the game. You know, we started playing and I started playing even harder. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, and and Kevin, uh, Derek said that that you couldn't make it personal this time. I I, I want to know, does that bothers you, or, or is just other thing that that happens during the fight week? No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be personal for me to punch you in the face. It doesn't have to be personal for me to to want to still knock you out. It doesn't have to be personal for him to still be emotional. And he's an emotional fella, you know. For him to say it's not personal, it must be pretty personal. So, we'll see. Like I said, he hasn't responded to none of my DMs this week. He hasn't looked at none of the things that I've shared about him this week. It's just it's just really sad, man. I just want to have a conversation with the man, and he doesn't want to talk to me. You know, I'm big mouth, and he don't want to talk to me. It's just it's really hurting my feelings. It may not be personal for him, but, man, I'm emotionally scarred. <laughs> I, have to, I have to ask you, man, what, what do, you, do you share with him on the social media? What do you, th do, do you send to him? Oh, hold on, let me look at it. It's so <laughs> It's it's so many that I have to look at it. Like it's it's every day, all day. Um, I'm just tagging them, just trying to talk to them. But what what one, their the memes, their one. videos? Yeah, it's videos. Totally. He had an MMA junkie video, and I tagged him, and I said, "Derek Brunson, bro, chill. We're not in the picture." He was talking about getting a title fight, and then there was this really good one. I really liked it. This one, it says, "You cannot suffer the past." or future because they do not exist. What you are suffering is the memory and your imagination. I said, Derek Brunson, don't think about the Izzy fight. It doesn't exist. So I thought that one was really amazing. <laughs> uh, I texted him. I said, yo, I can't wait to see you. He didn't message me back. I said, damn, I was trying to see you. Why you? Uh, why they make me leave in the car? This was the other day. We were both in the same venue. They made me leave before he pulled in. And I was just sad because I really wanted to see if he was doing the blonde hair, black hair, short hair, long hair. And then my coach ended up seeing him, and he's doing short blonde hair. So, you know. He looks fantastic. Did his hair really well, better than my hair. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And my last question, Kevin. Which type of fight do you imagine for, for Saturday night? Which fight am I what? Which type of fight are you imagining for, for Saturday night? Honestly, man, I, I don't really know. You know, it's like uh, hopefully Derek Brunson goes out there and stands up for a little while. Hopefully he shoots for a takedown and slams me like all the times he ever said he was going to. I just want him to do everything that he ever said he was going to do to me, and then uh, we could figure it out after that, you know? So, yeah. I just hope it gets real freaky in there, you know? The freaks come out at night. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Kevin, and good luck on Saturday, man. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, you're all set. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We will be joined next by UFC bantamweight Gustavo Lopez.
Got it? Okay, hi. Have fun. Bye. We are now joined by UFC Bantamweight Gustavo Lopez. Gustavo, thank you very much for joining us today. Hi. We will take our first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Gustavo, can you hear me? Yes. I want to ask you, when you've been the face of a promotion like Combate Americas and they sent you everywhere with the belt, what is the experience like to start over a bit in the UFC and, you know, work your way back up from the prelims to the main card with less attention? I actually love it. I love the fact that i am can been considered the underdog for all my fights. It just gives me another just, you know, another way to just kind of sh show that I belong. Like, they're, everyone, they just don't know about who, who I am yet. So I'm excited to go out there and just perform. How did it help you being managed by a, a former fighter and a pioneer in Misha Tate earlier in your career in terms of helping you to get to this level and just those extra lessons that you may not have gotten from someone else? No, uh, the, part, uh, the friendship with Misha and the way we kind of just she helped me with being my manager at the time was just... So much, uh, just took care of me so much. Physically, emotionally, she is like a mother to me. She's always been there. Even when I first started, when I first moved to Vegas, she, I lived on her couch and she eventually got, I got a room. And it just, she helped me grow so much. And I'm just 100% grateful to have the opportunity to be around such a pioneer and such a mentor. Her, her mental strength is one of the things that I really admire. It's just she makes, she fights so hard with all her heart and it just, beautiful the way she you know, works out, works out, yeah, works hard and everything. I know she's been doing her thing with one championship, but since she's been back in the States, has she had any input or just talks with you about the business side uh, as you've gone to the UFC? Yeah, uh, we just, we, well, she's still, she's back in the gym. She's just working out, uh, staying in shape, but we always get a little small conversation about, you know, just go out there, be, be myself and, you know, be that smiley, happy dude that I am. With your stuff yesterday about Adrian and everything else, I feel like people had different interpretations. Is there beef, or did those comments just come from the confidence in yourself? I think the, I think it just came. There is no beef. I actually saw Giannis on the soon I got back from the PI. We little fist bump. There's there's no animosity. There's no hatred. There's no nothing. We're you know we're two land fighters that love to fight. So we're gonna go out there and put on a show. My final question, just what would you like to show most from yourself this Saturday? I would love to just show my growth. Uh, lately, all my fights have been standing and I got a little bit of submissions, but I think my ground is so underestimated and I feel like I'm one of the best out there. So I'm excited to see, to uh, showcase my improvement and my standing, but also showcase my ability to do the full, you know, to be a well-rounded fighter. Hey, thanks, Gustavo, and good luck. Thank you. We'll take our next questions from Augusto Niaz Gay with Somos MMA. Your line is open. Gustavo, ¿cómo estás? ¿Todo bien? Muy bien, aquí. Gustavo, eh, mi primera pregunta es, eh, después de haber visto tu participación ayer en el, en el Media Day presencial y, y haber escuchado las respuestas, ¿se te nota que estás eh, un poco molesto con el hype que trae Yáñez y, y quizás con que no se te reconozca tanto en Estados Unidos como te reconocemos aquí en Latinoamérica, que sabemos de lo que sos capaz y, y de todo lo que has hecho en Combate Américas? Eh, ¿Es esto lo que te pasa? ¿Es esto lo que sentís? No, no de nada. Es como, eran las preguntas que me preguntaron, estoy listo y para esta pelea. Tu hype y lo que pasó, no, de nada no me importa. Uh, lo miré ayer, es, no, no hay nada, no, no, no hay animosity. Aquí estamos para pelear. Es, es, el, es el trabajo que hacemos. You know, pero había no, no, personas no, no me conocen aquí en Estados Unidos como me conocen allá con, latino, con los latinos. Yo sé que soy uno de los mejores del mundo y lo voy a enseñar este sábado. Perfecto. Bueno, a ver, realmente se ha visto una, una mejora impresionante. En, en lo poco que hemos podido ver el año pasado, debutaste contra Balishvili con 20 horas de anticipación. Te fue muy bien a pesar de la derrota. Después sí. lograste tu primera victoria contra, contra Birjak. ¿Qué es lo que vamos a ver este fin de semana en este nuevo Gustavo López? Ojalá miramos todo. Miramos sí. mi striking, miramos mi como estoy en el piso y, y, no agarro, y voy, voy a ir a agarrar la ganada para pa ganar. 
Perfecto. ¿Y, ¿Y de qué tenés que cuidarte en cuanto a lo que, lo que has analizado de, de Adrián Yáñez? Pues sus manos y sus, y sus, y sus pies. You know? Es bueno en, eh, arriba, en striking. Uh -huh. Pero, you ¿no? Know, la, la cosa es que le gusta ir para frente, también me gusta ir para frente a nosotros. Uh, vamos a estar ahí listos en el medio del, del octagon y ganar esta pelea. Perfecto. Y para terminar, Gustavo, quiero preguntarte. El año pasado peleaste dos veces. Quería saber cómo venís analizando este 2021, si pensás pelear un poco más seguido, si, si pretendés pelear dos, tres veces, quizás un poco más. ¿Qué, qué es lo que tenés pensado? Y, y, y me dejan, quiero pelear hasta otros tres veces más este año. Bien. Ojalá. Perfecto, perfecto, Gustavo. Muchas gracias y buena suerte el sábado. Gracias. We'll take our final questions with uh, Zach from UFC.com. I feel like I needed to go out there and perform. Uh, I feel like I am, my skill level is there. I train with one of the best in the world. We got Cody Stamen at the gym. We got Sterling, Marab showed up. We got Joseph Benavidez at Extreme Couture. We have a bunch of good dudes, and I know I belong in this division. For as deep as it is, I feel like I'm one of the top, but I'm, again, I'm a, I'm a newcomer coming in. So I'll go in there, I'll keep getting my Ws, and I'll, I'll slowly come up the ranks. I'm going to start with getting the It's great, man. It's actually uh, better than I expected. Uh, I expected a war in that fight. You know, I know Burchek could have been out there, and he's gone and out there and finished his last five opponents. So he was on, was on a first fight, finishing streak for a while. So I knew he was dangerous, but I knew we, were, we put on the work to be ready. I feel that his style excites me. The fact that he's such a good striker and he's gonna and he loves coming forward is is gonna be a fun fight. When two you get two land fighters in there, there's it's gonna be a war. So I'm excited to see how it goes. I feel like I'm overall the better well rounded fighter, you know? I feel like he, he, at the moment he had, might have better striking than me, but my striking's been good. I've been highlighting people for a minute. So it's I'm not scared about my striking. My, we've been working a lot on my striking. It's, Brown is just. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Oh, you're all set. Oh, thank you, guys. We will be joined next by UFC strawweight Cheyenne Bass.
We are now joined by UFC strawweight Cheyenne Base. Cheyenne, thank you very much for joining us today. Take our first questions from Julian Kivitz with Independent Media. Your line is open. Hi, Cheyenne. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Just not see you. <laughs> okay, it's all good. Um, I'm not sure if you can remember me. Um, this is Julian from Cape Town. Um, I interviewed you once or twice at the EFC, and um, you spoke about you were very vocal about um, fighters' rights and fighters being treated fair. I'm not sure if you can recall. I, I won't blame you if you don't understand or don't recall at least. Um, just tell me the, the step up in from a smaller promotion to the UFC in, in terms of how much the UFC values fighters and, and just the treatment you've been receiving since you stepped up from the Dana White Con series and where you are right now. Well, the step up for me, it, for me, it's really no step up. I have so many fights that for me, I've always believed I could be at this level. And now that I am at this level, I'm not even celebrating. I just need to keep, continue to prove myself and prove my worth and prove why I feel I'm with the highest level. No, so, uh, what I meant was in terms of the treatment you're getting um, from the promotion and in terms of them, oh. the, the promotion looking after you, you know? Oh, the, the treatment is wonderful. Like when I came here, I landed here in Vegas on Tuesday, and, you know, from the Contender Series, being in the same hotel with the same workers to now being in the UFC at the same hotel, the same workers, the treatment us fighters get here, it's been unbelievable. It's been mind blowing. Like, I almost feel like I just don't even deserve it yet. Like that's how... <laughs> They are to us. I mean, my husband and I, we just sat down last night and we just feel super blessed mm. alongside the spiders. Yeah, and, and I obviously know personally of JP's his journey also and your journey from South Africa and also just credit to you guys also as a as a as a couple what you've been through. I mean, I've I've watched your journey and JP, like I said, from his wrestling days when you were still a kid and to where you guys were um, from the EFC and you move to the USA and it's, it's already tough as for fighters to find their feet and to get the opportunity to fight in an organization like the UFC, but for JP to leave the country also, his homeland. Um, what is the challenges for you as a couple? I mean, a married couple, you are making history also. And, and what's the excitement that comes along with it just the way you are right now? Well, when we left South Africa, we left October 1st, 2019. Now here we are, we're making our debuts together March 20th. In that time frame, I cannot lie, it, it's super tough for us. Like, we luckily were able to get out of the country before the pandemic. Here, mm. but since we left, it everything's been life changing. We basically had to start back from ground zero. We came with little money. And we just had to restart our lives together. We were fortunate enough to fight together for LFA and fight for their contender, and both earned contracts. But we're just now getting on our feet. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing to be able to go alongside with you on this journey together. Like when in South Africa, we were at our highest high together. He was doing wonderful there. He took care. Of now, when we left South Africa and together here, both hit rock bottom. We both were at our lowest lows. Our love for each other is just growing every day and being able to do this together again and nothing. And, and yeah, I wouldn't keep you long, Zondra uh, Saik, from South Africa. All the best, and we are rooting for you and JP all the way. God bless, eh? Thank you so much. Cool. We'll take our next questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Cheyenne, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Uh, Cheyenne, a lot of people loved the scrum yesterday, myself included. I wanted to ask, how did you first meet JP? Oh, it's, it's quite a story. <laughs> Actually, um, I used to live here in Las Vegas, um, and my head coach was Dennis Davis out at Extreme Couture here. And my head coach actually traveled to Cape Town one day to go corner a teammate of mine. They actually, JP and head coach back then, ran into each other, they knew each other, and JP was questioning him. He was like, I know you have a lot of females uh, over at Extreme Couture. He was like, who's the nicest girl? And <laughs> my coach was like, I think you would really like this girl, Cheyenne. And crazy enough, he was actually already trying to message me on Instagram, and I, I was kind of a brat. I ignored him a lot for many months, actually. When my coach told him about me then, then he was messaging me even more. 
by writing me all these nice things. And one day I was just like, oh, man, this guy's very persistent. I was like, let me just write him back and I'll give him some attention. And the day I started writing him back, he was like, you're the most beautiful woman in the world. I'm going to marry you. You don't know it yet. And I was just like, you're right. I don't know it yet. Like, this guy's crazy. I was like, he's just telling me everything I want to hear. But he was actually scheduled to fight and... We were just messaging. We would talk to every day, and he was like, hey, my fight fell through. I'm going to come see you in America. What? I was like, no way. Little did I know, that man showed up at my doorstep, flew all the way from South Africa, showed up at my doorstep, and he was like, listen, I am not here to make you my girlfriend. I'm here because you are my girlfriend. So he kind of gave me no choice, but, I mean, I fell in love with him since then. The day we met each other, we have not left each other's side. He stayed in Vegas for a month and I went back to South Africa with him, not to move, I just went there to go train with his team, just be with him and get to know him more. And then while we were there, I I realized that I love this guy. I was like, he's my best friend. Where do we go from here? I'm all the way in Vegas, you're all the way in South Africa. How do we make this work? It, it just didn't seem real. He was like, listen, I'll take care of you here. Did he went to Vegas, I packed up all the stuff. I, traveled to South Africa and started a life with him and we've been inseparable since the moment. Well, for one, that's very beautiful. Two, I think your coach deserves some credit. That's the real MVP right there for JP. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I know your dad will be in the corner real quick. Did JP win him over quickly or did it take a minute? Actually, so my dad's never liked any guy that I've ever liked, first of all. So when I told him about JP, obviously it's like a tricky situation when you're talking to someone online. But when I told my dad about him at first, my dad actually knew of him. My dad is the biggest MMA fan I know. And when I told him his name, he was like, oh, that's the guy that suplexed the guy on Contender Series. And I was like, yeah, that's him. And so my dad knew of him. Um, I introduced him to my family when he was here. And immediately my family just felt this vibe that, you know, who, who has a man? at the time, 22 years old, just gets up, travels on a flight, doesn't, I mean, he doesn't know, I mean, he knew I was real, but just traveled and came to me and he was like, listen, you're my girlfriend. Like, I'm not leaving here without you. <laughs> I think my parents kind of realized that he was young, but he was a man of his word. And they knew of him and his, his training gym over in South Africa. And when I told my family I wanted to go there, they were very supportive of it, shockingly which I did not think my dad would be because I'm a daddy's girl. But my parents, since day one, have been very supportive. And my dad loves him. My dad considers him just as close as So it's been very nice to have, a, have my family love him just as much. My final question, you, once again, he's going to be in the corner. And uh, you told the story how you told your dad you want to be the female karate kid. So how important will his voice be in the corner along with JP and your coach? I told my dad not to speak in the corner. My dad is there specifically just to watch a show. I mean, my dad, I mean, he has worked relentlessly towards helping me make my dreams come true. And the fact that there's no crowd, there is no way that we could not let my dad miss this for anything. I mean, my dad has done everything in his power to help me since a baby to stay in karate, stay in taekwondo when I made that transfer, and then when I made the transfer to MMA. He's been my number one fan. Ever since I started fighting, he used to study every single girl. and it, it, It's just unbelievable, the support from my dad, and there's no way that I don't... I so he's just there for the show. <laughs> Well, I hope he enjoys it. Cheyenne, thank you for the time and good luck. Thank you so much, guys. We'll go next to Damon Martin with MMAfighting.com. Your line is open. Hey, Cheyenne. Uh, I know a lot of questions about you and JP fighting on the same show, so I apologize for more of those. But, uh, but you know, a lot of fighters talk about when they have teammates on the same card, you know, having someone around that understands what it's like to go through weight cutting and fight preparation. It's just nice to have that kind of person around. Uh, what's it like with, with a husband and wife? Because I imagine that's a, that brings a whole other kind of dynamic to this week. Oh, it's husband, wife, and a teammate on this card of ours. So uh, it's been awesome. Like, we, we personally love it. Whenever JP fights, I'm cutting weight with him. Whenever I fight, he's cutting weight with me. So the fact that we just get to go and do this together, cut weight together, 
it it's nice because it's paychecks one night and we're both doing it together that's the way i look at it as if one fights i fight if he fights this is our job this is what we do again we're best friends so in the house if one's dieting for a fight the other person's dieting right we really respect each other at this level and it it's just been so fun to experience experience this together the same nights and this whole week has been nothing but good vibes we have our teammate macy also fighting on this card it it's just been Nothing but happy happiness here all week for us. Even leading into the fight, you know, obviously the tension, uh, grumpiness is always going to be there some days. But then every night when we go to bed, we just speak about we have an opportunity to and start our legacy. And for that reason, we're bringing everything in the kitchen. It, obviously, it seems like you've uh, you got a very positive, upbeat experience with this, and I know I'm sure you've heard stories or had questions about the pressure that comes along with this, though, with both of you fighting on one card. Uh, I know Anthony Pettis has said in the past, you know, after he fought on the same card as brother Sergio, he really didn't want to do that again because it's just so much, you know, so much emotion involved with watching, you know, someone you love fight, and then you got to go out and do it again. And obviously, that's how this is going to work with JP fighting early in the night, and you on the main card. Uh, have you wrapped your head around that? I mean, it seems like you're really upbeat about it, but I know there is a certain level of pressure that comes along with that. Of course, there is a little bit of pressure, but at the same time, this is going to be my 25th cage fight. It, I got to be able to control my emotions. Um, I don't really see what kind of the big deal is, but I guess that's me. Everyone is different. I respect what Anthony says about his brother. Like, that's his family. Like, but my husband, I've watched him prepare. I Whatever happens is in God's hands. There's nothing I can do. I trust my husband's capability to go out there and get his get the job done for us and trust my capability to go out there and get the job done. So for me, it's just going out there and showing the support as a wife. I'm going to make that walk with him. Damn straight, I'm going to make that walk with him, actually. Like, I'm going to be right there by his side just like he's going to be. And with that being said, you know, coming off the Contender Series, you know, Contender Series fighters do end up getting – you know, a lot of attention coming into the UFC because you do kind of get a, a little bit of a bigger platform to come into the UFC because a lot of people watch the Contender Series. It's a more intimate show with only five fights on one card, that kind of thing. Uh, but we have seen, you know, the pre you know, we have seen some Contender Series fighters go on, have great things. Obviously, your teammate Jeff Neal, you know, great performances, top 10 fighter, top 15 fighter. We have some others we've seen, you know, kind of fall short. So how do you deal with that part of it, coming in with the expectation, you know, coming out to Contender Series? And, and obviously, I'm sure you want to make a big debut. I don't really see any expectations. I feel like my Contender Series showed who exactly who I was. And I feel all my fights show exactly who I am. Every time I step into that cage, I'm going to just go out there and I'm going to stay true to myself, and I'm going to show you guys what I know about myself. And that's what I love about fighting is it's a mental warfare in there. I mean, we're all skilled. Once you're at this highest level, even at Contender Series, that's the high level to get to there. Everyone's good, but when you get in there, it's a 50-50 chance, but if you have any self-doubt in yourself, it's going to show. So whenever I step into that cage, I have 100% confidence in myself, and I'm going to just show you guys who I am and what and last one for me, uh, obviously you and JP are looking to make history uh, as the first husband and wife to win both of your fights on a UFC card. So can you give me a prediction for his fight and then for your fight? I don't really like to make predictions because I'm not no Conor McGregor. <laughs> he, he can make the predictions. Me, I just go out there and whatever happens, happens. Obviously, we won't want the finish. I can see my husband definitely submitting his guy or TKing his guy for sure. Me, I can see any I'm not going to make a prediction because whatever is presented in that in that moment I'm going to take. Thanks very much. Thank you guys. We'll take our next questions from Omer Mert with Esport. Your line is open. Hello Shane. Hello Shane. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you. You came to UFC and all these media and other stuff. How does it make you feel? It makes me feel good. It definitely makes me feel good. I've been in this sport a very long time, and I've always known I can get to this level. And now that I am here at this level and with the UFC, it, it's just very bittersweet for me. It makes me almost like want to cry. <laughs> okay. 
We know the biggest goal always the title, but what do you want to achieve first in the UFC? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, we know biggest goal always the title, but what do you want to achieve first in the UFC? I want to achieve my first win in the UFC. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my English. It's okay. I just want to achieve going out there, winning my, uh, winning by a finish in my debut. That's my first goal. And then from there, I'll evaluate my next goal. I go by little goals. Obviously, the goal is to get to that belt, but I need to take baby steps to get there. Okay, my last question. If you win this match, who do you want from the UFC in your second fight? Whoever is there a specific me. name? Or? No, I mean, there's, there's quite a few girls in this division. They're all killers. They're all good. I'm just going to take whoever they give me. Okay, thank you, Cheyenne. Good luck on Saturday. Thank you very much, uh, Cheyenne. You're set. Thank you. We will be joined next by number 11 ranked UFC women's bantamweight, Macy Chasson.
We are now joined by number 11 ranked GFC women's bantamweight, Macy Chasson. Macy, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. So our first question is from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hello, Missy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Good. Um, so to start with the obvious one. There have been a couple hurdles getting back to the cage for you. How are you feeling as the fight is finally just about here? Man, it's been, I think for everyone, 2020 until now has been a pretty rough year and a lot of ups and downs. And uh, you do what you can, you know, getting sick and then having, you know, heart surgery and stuff like that. It, it uh, definitely was a setback, but... Um, you know, I think a little bit of time off, I was able to grow mentally, you know, and, and figure out my game, you know, as, as a ranked fighter now. So uh, it's almost a blessing in disguise. I mean, it sucked. I was out for a while. I wasn't able to fight Sajara and, you know, and just getting through a bunch of injuries. It's, it's never fun, but it's a part of the game. And I think just being focused and staying focused, you know, on what's important in front of you is, uh, is, is it's the biggest thing. So, uh, so I'm good. I'm ready to go. Uh, you know, I'm actually like having fun this week besides the weight cut. But uh, but I'm really looking forward to getting back in the cage and just being in the moment. Can we go back a bit? You know, so obviously with the fight recently, you know, you get through fight week, you're here. And then they tell you that Marianne has COVID. They got to push the fight back. Can you just explain your reaction and everything to move the fight around? I mean... I was already in a good place, you know, that week. So it sucks because it, it's like, okay, that means your camp's prolonged, you know, and I really wanted to fight Marion. So, you know, getting a short notice opponent kind of really wasn't, uh, didn't seem like a good idea for me because I really, I'm, I'm ready to start fighting good girls. You know, I'm ready to start fighting people who are going to bring something to the table and I have to work really hard for. And it's something that, that I enjoy and look forward to when I go to training, knowing that I'm, I'm, I'm going to fight someone who's ranked and someone who's been around for a while. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it sucks. You know, we had to postpone it, but it just means more time to work and more information to gather. Can I ask, uh, what is it about Marion that you like so much? Is it about rankings? Is it about the style matchup? What is it that you really wanted to stick to fighting her? You know, I think stylistically is one. Uh, ranking is also a big factor. Um, she's also a vet. I mean, she's her last three opponents have not been, you know, Kat Zanganu and uh, Rocky uh, Pennington. And, you know, I mean, she's she's fought Andrade. She's fought a lot of notable people, you know, and, and I'm ready to put myself against someone like that. You know, I think it's I think it's time for me to step up. It's been a year since I fought and, you know, I've grown a lot since then and I'm ready to produce and have fun and and show people, you know, what I can do against someone like that. You know, not that I think that necessarily I'm going to go out and destroy her. I mean, it could happen. It could not happen, right? It, it's all about testing myself against game opponents. And I think she's a game opponent. Hey, thank you, Macy, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Macy. Uh, you're all set. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool.
We will be joined shortly by UFC welterweight Max Griffin. We are now joined by UFC welterweight Max Griffin. Max, thank you very much for taking the time today. What up? How are you guys doing? Good. We'll uh, take our first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Max. How are you? Beautiful. How are you guys? I'm doing pretty good, personally. Uh, congratulations. Welcoming a new child. So the obvious question, do you feel that new motivation and everything else people talk about as you go into this one? Yeah, bro, I got that that pregnancy glow, bro. I uh, I honestly feel like a papa bear. Like, uh, it's not like I need, needed any more motivation than I already have. I have a son already. He's nine, but he's like a teenager. But this new baby, bro, it gave me, I feel that primal, like, protection. Like, even when I was at home after he was born, like, anyone looked at me. I mean, I know it was fight week, you know, kind of fight mode, but... It's that primal, that primal thing, bro. I feel like a mama bear with her cubs, and I'm ready to, to unleash. I would, yeah, I'm ready to unleash on anyone who's in front of me, and who's in front of me is. All right, I hear you. Um, obviously, routine is very important in terms of getting into the zone when you finally hit fight night. So how have you managed that as your fight, keep, fight camp winds down? Because obviously babies, they, you know, they have their own schedule. They have their own plans. Yeah, man. The first couple of weeks or the first week I had about, my sleep was about two hour nights. So it was kind of, kind of tough. But then he eased in. I started getting full sleep. But this last, I mean, when I got to the hotel fight week, I knew I'd get a full sleep. I actually had the longest sleep of my life last night. Uh, I went to sleep at about 10.30, woke up at 7.30, about eight, eight hours, nine hours, I don't know. But I, I can't sleep that long. Too many dreams. I started dreaming. I had nightmares, good dreams. Um, but I'm recharged. I'm refreshed. I love my baby, but you know, when I'm sleeping, bro, it just... It just hits my, I get, you can't ignore it. You know what I mean? I don't know my lady take care of him in the middle of the night. I might go make a bottle or something, but he cries, bro. It just hits your soul. They feel it in your bones. So it's good to get some, you know, peace and quiet this week and ready to unload and get back to my family. To talk about the fight, just stylistically with Song, how do you feel you match up with him and what do you think he does well? Song's a good fighter. You know, when I first got the call for for him, I wasn't too entirely excited. You know, he's a good guy though. He has a good right hand. He has some good good kicks, but um, he doesn't like pressure. I'm Mr. Pressure, Mr. Aggression. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm more well rounded. I got better cardio. I hit harder. I'm meaner. Better wrestling. Better. He comes from a good place, but um, I got almost six six inches on him on reach. 
contributing to that. Well, Max, best of luck and thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll take our final questions from Zach with UFC.com. You know, that was my first fight with my new mental coach, actually like having fun. And so for me to be able to, to beat the guy all around, piece him up. I mean, it seems slow when I was in there, like slow motion, but when I watched it that night, I was heavily impressed with my speed, my angles, commentary, you know, on and Dominic Cruz talking about my footwork and how good I looked and Trevor Whitman was very impressed and those guys are some of the best martial artists ever on the planet. So to hear that from them was was a and then, you know, this just to to have my way with a guy that had so much hype in him with the story and all that stuff, it was good. You know, they kinda looked like he wanted him to win and you know, for me to go and spoil this party and get a big win. I mean, I would have finished him probably about 20 seconds after the ear thing. I mean, he was flushing down the drain. He was bloody and battered and couldn't breathe flushing down. But to get that huge elbow and to be part of history, I mean, it was on World Star. It was on everything. It went viral, TMZ. Like, so now, you know, I'm. it could have got swept under the rug if I just would have TKO'd him. But to TKO and have arguably one of them nastiest finishes in UFC history. I'm happy to be part of it. Can't wait for to go back out there and have more fun. Like I, w I was rewarded for fun. So now it's like, hey, what's going to happen when I even have more fun? You'll see Saturday night. So How reassuring was it? Yeah, the cardio thing, which when I went to the PI, I was off the charts on, like, not normal. And that that's an attribute. That's something I can use. On well, my last fight, really the only, you know, corner I remember sitting in, or standing in the corner, I didn't sit down. I was just, hey, pass me some water. I didn't talking like I'm talking now. Give me some water. More volume, Max. Just more volume. I mean, it was little stuff. It wasn't, uh, uh, uh. It's usually like, uh, uh, uh. It's all crazy. This was just like, okay, a little more volume. Like, literally. Okay, you got more gas. We'll put it on him. So I did, and I felt so normal. Scary. been good it's been good i mean song has some weapons we got to watch out for you know right hand obviously that's really the main thing he does he only does well when he backs you up no one backs me up especially him i've fought this is my 11th ufc fight i've fought some scary ufc guys elizas west santos mike perry alvis calvin Oliveira. Um, i have i fought some scary scary dudes no offense, but um, he's not scary. Put it on him, put the pressure on him, finish the guy. I've been using my my tactics. So with with my mental coach, got to the core values, and now we still do that. But now we're implementing grateful journal. Every day I write something. Thank you. If you're having a bad day or anything, you just look back and. Man, you get filled with good feelings and good vibes when you think about all the good things in your life. This and this and this. It's not bad. You also do a thing in three, like a kind of like an after war training after all my three things you did well and three things you need to work on. It's not, oh, I did this, took him down. Or if I got caught on something. So I'd review that. Oh, yeah, I didn't like how that happened. So it really hyper-focuses you on accountable in your training every day. 
okay, and then you write it down, you can go back and look and see what you've got to work on, and then you can fix those things. Because if you don't pay attention to what's going on, if you just kind of blindly go through training, you don't have as much success as if you're working on things, and then you could get over certain things, and, you know. Uh, No, it's going to happen on its own. My plan is to have fun. I'm having fun all week. Yeah, I was just on my Oculus Quest 2, just in the room, just on my VR. Just having fun, man. I'm, it's good times. And also, I'm, I'm very excited about this, too. They actually wanted me to fight this guy on March 6th. Sonic card. But I feel like my son was too soon. He was supposed to be born. He ended up coming late, February 12th. Seven. So that wouldn't have worked. My lady was fighting March 6th. I was like, I have to work, baby. Like, hey, can I fight them before? They said, no. How about March 20th? So <clears throat> rather than getting buried on the card on March 6th, I'm on March 20th, more of an open card. I'm on the main card. I'm on ESPN. UFC is rarely on ESPN. I feel like it's once every few months. I don't know the schedule, but it seems like it's on ESPN handful of times a year and to be on being everyone's living room at home you know you don't have to have the ESPN plus app world will see and the odds are coming crazy I was minus 125 now I'm minus 200 crash this guy and also man plus 550 for me to win by knockout and that's crazy so if anyone wants to make some money double down on All right, thank you very much, Max. You're all set. Thank you. <laughs> we will be joined next by UFC lightweight Brad Riddell. We are now joined by UFC lightweight Brad Riddell. Brad, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, pleasure. How are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, you'll get your first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Brad, how are you? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. So it's been obviously a busy month for city kickboxing. Is there more or less anxiety being one of the last ones to go out there and fight after seeing a bunch of your friends already go first? 
Uh, there's none. It's just exactly the same as, as it was before. Like, we all um, really enjoy competing and fighting. The fact that we get to all fight pretty close together and then relax uh, after the fight together, I think that's, uh, that's pretty cool. We're lucky like that. Yeah. Last year, you know, Arasanya and yourself did quite a lot of traveling. Obviously, a ton of quarantine that comes along with that. What are your cheat codes by now for all that time stuck in the hotel? What are those things that really get you through it when you've just been there a really long time already? Uh, PlayStation, a lot of Call of Duty, uh, a lot of reading, and a lot of self-reflection, man. Like, whether you win or whether you lose, there's a lot of time to... Uh, think about uh, how the fight went and stuff like that or your trip and other stuff in life. So, yeah, quarantine's uh, not, it's not great, but um, you can definitely uh, make it beneficial if you, um, if you try. You can make it really bad or you can make it, um, you know, make it a little bit better. Uh, what's your gamer tag and PlayStation or Xbox for people who want to, you know, shoot people oh, with you online? Yeah, but for Call of Duty, it's one, uh, Quakecom 55. So, yeah, I'm okay. I wouldn't rate myself too high, but I'm okay. <laughs> well, hopefully we get some people who can help you out. <laughs> I'm talking about the fight, you know, did you take much from Gregor's fight with Kevin Lee, or do you feel just you're a completely different fighter, so you'll approach it differently? Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, like, obviously, um, he exposed him a little bit, um, but sure that hasn't affected Gregor too much, to be honest. Uh, Kevin caught him with uh, two beautiful shots, just like Gregor said himself. Um, it was quite early on in the fight, so yeah, I'm a complete different fighter to Kevin. So yeah, the same result would be great, but uh, we we'll have to see how it goes. My final question: Just what do you want to show most for yourself in your performance on Saturday? Ah, uh, that I can hang with a really, really high-level wrestler. That I can hang with the All-American wrestler, and uh, from from there on up, it'll be a uh, there will be a lot of worry for the other top. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Brad. Good luck. Thank you. We'll go next to Damon Martin with MMAfighting.com. Your line is open. Hey, Brad. Uh, coming into this fight, you know, so much is being made about the, the, the contrast in styles you're striking against his wrestling. Uh, but do you think maybe we're making too much of that considering, you know, this is mixed martial arts? Because you do see some guys and, and some girls you get overly, you know, they get overly, uh, you know, taken over by, you know, oh, he's going to try to wrestle me or, oh, they're going to try to strike with yeah. me. And it kind of takes him out of their game. Do you just have to kind of put all that out of your head? Yeah, man, 100%. Like, you can, obviously, uh, his wrestling is great, but you cannot just focus on that. You have to focus on your own thing. Otherwise, the fight's going to go his way. So, um, yeah, I do agree with you on that. People do get caught up on that. Uh, I'm not one of them. Like, obviously, in my other fights, I've just fought my for my fight and you know sometimes i've been taken down and i got back up and carried on doing my thing so yeah i i'm just gonna do my thing out there you can't get in gregor's head but you know we've seen it a million times when you go through a really tough knockout like that you know it can change you it can really change you in your approach to fighting mentally yeah. wise your first time and this is going to be the first time he's going to get hit since then uh, will you look for those kind of tendencies in that opening round if you tag him the first time and you kind of look in his eyes and see that? Because we have seen that a lot of times where you just, you, some people are just never the same after a knockout like that. Yeah, 100%. Like, uh, I'm definitely going to look for a bit of PTSD and see if it's still there. It could be, it, it couldn't be. Uh, like I've said a few times this week that um, knockouts like that are beneficial or detrimental, um, especially your first loss. You can, it can bring you back uh, better or uh, you can never come back at all. So I'll definitely be looking to see how he reacts to me when we jump in there and, and touch gloves and get going. There's obviously no shame in losing to Kevin Lee, who is a, you know incredible fighter in his own right. But you know, going into that fight, so much attention was on Gregor's undefeated, kind of the next big thing. But do you feel like you do still get you know, a pretty quality win here over a guy who you know still has a lot of hype behind him? You know, obviously, again, no shame in losing to Kevin Lee, but. Uh, do you feel like this does move you forward in terms of where you want to be in this division? Of course it does. Of course it does. Greg is still an amazing fighter. He's still uh, you know, very decorated in what he's done. And you say there's uh, like no shame in losing to Kevin Lee. I don't think there's any shame in losing in the UFC. You know, we're a very small percentile of the population that get in there and fight. Uh, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of balls to step in there and, and, and fight someone. You know, you're stripping yourself down naked in front of the world. Um, and, and putting everything out there. So I don't think there's any shame in losing all. I think you should be, be very proud that you step in there and, and go to war against somebody else. So 
Yeah. For the people that give people shit when they lose, man. Yeah. I'm not going to say what I think of them. Yeah, understandable. Uh, with that being said, you know, you have engaged in some battles, you know, in the UFC. You've been in those wars. Uh, do you feel like that is an advantage for you in this fight? You know, obviously before the Kevin Lee fight, you know, Gregor had been pretty dominant. You know, he'd been kind of, I won't say running through guys. That's an insult to his opponents, but he'd been pretty dominant in his performances. Do you kind of look to test him to see, you know, if he can go in those deep waters, if you don't, you know, let's say knock him out early. Do you want to see if he can go in those deep waters with you? I'm sure, I'm sure he can go to those deep waters with me. Um, Judging by his other opponents, like he just he dragged them too deep for themselves. Like maybe they didn't prepare for him or they underestimated his uh, wrestling. But I've never underestimated any opponent that I fought. I've had so many fights now in my life that you just can't do that. I've done it a couple of times earlier in my career and lost some important fights. And from then on, I've just never done it. And I think yeah, it's it's obviously beneficial for me that I've been the distance quite a few times with some really hard fighters that were gritty. Uh, so yeah, I think that works in my um, favor to fight someone like Gregor. Last one for me, I remember talking to Dan Hooker before his fight uh, earlier this year and the kind of crazy quarantine he had to go through going home uh, just because, you know, the restrictions are a little tighter uh, in New Zealand and Australia and obviously uh, what we're doing here in America. I'm curious, uh, what do you have to go through when you finally get a chance to go home? Yeah, Dan, Dan's was a bit savage, you know, I really felt for him because of his family and stuff. Um, and it's always a little bit harder to bear with, with the loss, but he bounced back really well. He was positive. We talked to him uh, during that time, and um, mine is not as bad as that. Mine's, I think, five weeks total, so I leave on the 3rd of April. Well, I leave America on the 1st of April, and I've got like a ugh, like a 40-odd-hour flight home, a couple of transits, um, so mine's not too bad. I'm here for Volcon stuff that extended a little bit, but uh, I would have done that anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. We'll go back. We'll go next to Pablo Santa Maria with Note to MMA Ecuador. Your line is open. Hi, Brian. Can you hear me? Yep. Gotcha. Okay. The first thing I want to ask you is what are your thoughts of Gregor as an opponent? Oh, he's a worthy opponent. You know, he's uh, it's a difficult fight. Um, you know, he, he's good. Yeah, everyone knows he wrestles, but uh, he also doesn't mind to stand there and throw some punches. Like, uh, that's to my benefit, I think, but uh, he, he's a gamer. He's uh, It's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to fighting him. That's why I said I'll do it. Okay, for sure. Uh, this is your fourth fight in the UFC, and every time you get on the octagon, you get better opponents. So if you get the victory over Gregor, do you have someone in your mind to call? Uh, not quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, I'm going to deal with Gregor this weekend. I'm going to focus on that fight, get tunnel vision on that. And then, you know, I do have plans after, but they're far, far, far in the back of my mind. And uh, I'll bring them to uh, fruition after that fight. For sure. Uh, City Kickboxing is known for the elite takedown defense they have. And do you think that will be an important key to get the victory? Of course. Of course. Like, every, every time Gregor gets me down, that's, you know, that's time to his advantage. So I definitely don't want to get taken down. Could happen. It couldn't happen. Uh, fights a fight and things tend to change in there at the last uh, split second. So, yeah, I'm I'm pretty confident in my takedown defense and I'm more confident in my ability to get up and I'm most confident in my ability not to give up. So, yeah. Okay, and the last question for me is, it's what's your prediction for the fight? Well, I'm going to win. <laughs> That's always my prediction for the fight. I'm gonna <laughs> win. How I win, I will have to wait until the end of it. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to win. Okay, thank you very much, Brad, for your time and good luck on the fight. Thank you. We'll go next to Ryan McCarthy with Low Kick MMA. Your line is open. Hey, Brad. How's it going, man? Good. How are you? Good, good. Just a couple questions here. You're 3-0 um, you're in, in the UFC, six straight wins overall. Uh, what would be next for you if you, um, you know, when you get a dub over, you know, ranked opponent Gregor Gillespie here? Is, uh, are, are you trying to um, go into the top 10 for an opponent? Is there a certain name that you're looking out for here in the lightweight division? Uh, there's not a certain name yet. You know, you've always got to wait for uh, other fights to play out to, to see what the uh, best, um, you know, pick is um, for me. But I fully believe I deserve someone close to the top 10 um, after you're going through Gregor. Uh, top 10 or close to. Yeah, for sure. And do you, since you're in the lightweight division, do you have a prediction of uh, what the next um, lightweight title fight will be? There's obviously a lot of uh, 
a lot of names out there that are um, you know vying for that shot. So, well, personally, I think Dustin and Charles Oliveira um, fighting for that belt. Those guys have uh, earned their spot. Sure. And uh, is there a certain um, cheat meal you get after after a W over Gregor on Saturday? <laughs> Yeah, man, I always like, I like smoking meat. I like eating barbecue and stuff like that. I'm a, I'm a big meat eater, so that's what I'll be hunting for over here. America's got pretty good barbecue. Let's see what, uh, see what Vegas has. Nice, man. Well, we look forward to seeing you. Best of luck on Saturday. We'll go next to Nikita with Sport Express. Your line is open. Brett, big pleasure to talk to you. So man, how are you? Uh, I'm very good, thank you. Brett, Israel Adesanya once said that you are one of the toughest and bravest person he's ever met in his life. Do you remember your first meet with Israel and your first impression of him? My, f my first meet, my first impression of Israel? Yes. Jeez, uh, I think the first time I met Izzy would have been oh, coming on like nine eight or nine years ago, eight years, he used to, uh, we were at different gyms and uh, a couple of times a week or sometimes uh, Eugene would bring uh, him and a couple of other guys up to spar at our gym um, in a different part of the city because our gym was uh, quite known for like quite hard sparring and uh, we probably sparred a little bit too hard back then and Fizzy would come up and, and spar us and it was the same thing back then, like he was hard to hit, you know, at distance and then so I used to get in close and get him in the pocket. That's where I'd have the most success. And then I spent so much time doing that. He got good at doing that. And then obviously from there on, he got good at doing everything. That was my uh, that was my first times meeting him. And same same thing then as now, man. It's it was hard to fight him. And he's always been a good a good dude. You know, he's got heaps of energy. He's real fun. Yeah, I've always had uh, good things for Israel. Uh, Brett. Uh, now we see more and more knockouts against wrestlers in MMA with flying knees, with knees, and you're a Muay Thai kickboxing guy. How much do you love knee and how you make stake on this type of strike against such short wrestler like uh, Gregor? Oh, it's a, it's a huge benefit. I mean, like, if if no one's throwing their legs up or their knees up or something like that, it's, it's very inviting to just go and shoot. But uh, when someone sticks their knee up, you know, it changes your mind pretty quick because you know if your head meets the knee, everyone knows which one's gonna win. So it's a huge part of uh, fighting a high level wrestler. Brad, thank you very much. Good luck. Pleasure. Thank you. We will take our final questions from Omer Mert with Escort. Your line is open. Hello, Brad. How are you? Good. Thank you. How are you? Thank you, sir. Uh, Brett, there are a lot of important names coming out New Zealand. What did your country do right and suddenly such MMA stars starts to appear? Can I get some advice for my country? Um, I think, I don't know, it's just, I guess it's, um, <laughs> we're just very stubborn. Like, we're a very small country and we weren't very noticed um, before this. We had... We had so many amazing fighters in our past that found, probably found it difficult and unfortunately they didn't get to, to get onto the world stage just because of our location in the world. It was hard to get out and it's not, it's not anything that we're doing lately. It's just the stuff that we've always done and we're very lucky that Dan Hooker and uh, Israel have like elevated our, our platform in the UFC and now we have a lot of exposure. So, and Mark Hunt, you know, as well, like those guys got us noticed and now it's easier for us to get into the UFC. So... It's not what we're doing now, it's what we've always been doing. And we're just, yeah, we owe those guys a lot. Okay, thank you. My other question, do you have a dream match in the UFC? Oh, sorry, what? Do you have a dream match in the UFC, any legend or current name? Dream match? Um, oh... I think, I, you know, I, I would really like to experience, like, fighting uh, Khabib. Obviously, he's finished, but just watching that guy over his whole career, like, he was such a dominant force, and it didn't matter who he got in the, in the cage with, you just saw him crush them and just fold them. And 
I think it would be a, a crazy experience to to fight him and feel that strength and feel that that you know that that power and you know, then you can go away and <laughs> really think about what you have to work on and, and appreciate how long he's how long he's been working on that skill set. So that would be cool. That would be uh, just more for um, yeah experience. Okay, my last question, uh, Brad. What do you think Adesanya's last performance? Did you ever ever chance to talk after the fight? I haven't talked to him about the fight. We've just talked. I think uh, I told him that somebody, he's doing quarantine in my home city, so I told him somebody wants to drop him off some barbecue. And my mom dropped him off heaps of muffins. So I think that's about as much as I've said to him. But um, uh, I, th I thought his performance was great. You know, I think... He's, he's daring to do something that a lot of people uh, haven't done and will probably never do, like going up to fight a man that big, you know. Israel's a very tall middleweight, but he's not an enormous one. Like, he's not hugely heavy and stuff. So for him to go and fight a man that big and, and risk his record and, you know, dare to be great, it's awesome. You know, when I lose, I'm, like, insanely proud of that guy and what he did and... Uh, He's going to come back and do do just as just as many phenomenal things as he's done in the past. And yeah, don't don't sleep on Israel. There's some there's some big things coming for that guy still. Okay, Red. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. You're all set. Yo.
We will be joined shortly by UFC bantamweight Adrian Yanez. Okay, I was, I was like, all right. I was like, huh, I'm just sitting here. <laughs> Camera straight on your face, don't know what to do, don't know what to do with your hands. <laughs> we are now joined by UFC bantamweight Adrian Yanez. Adrian, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, man, uh, just happy to be here, man. I'm super excited. We'll take our first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Kate Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Adrian, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you're doing great. You just got to smile for the camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I'm super excited, man. I'm just blessed to be here, man. Um, talk to me. 2020 was quite a ride for a lot of people, but you had your fight on Contender. You had a successful UFC debut. How would you sum up 2020 overall for yourself personally? And it, it was a, definitely a roller coaster. Uh, it was a lot of ups and downs, uh, but at the end of it, like, at the end, at the end of it, you know, for me, it was really great. I was able to, you know, put all the years of the hard work of me finally putting into like, of me working and putting in the work into MMA, uh, finally had paid off for me in 2020, and and just for it to happen in a spectacular fashion, like in the contenders, and then for my UFC debut, for it for it to happen like the way it did, man, it, it I couldn't be any more happier. Uh, it, 2020 was a great year for me. Uh, besides, like, the whole pandemic and everything going on, you know, uh, you know, a lot of craziness that happened. But, it, you know, the end of 2020 was a really good one for me. I listened to you speak yesterday about how you've now been able to leave your full-time job and focus completely on MMA. When you're in that kind of position, does it create pressure? Because it's like, you know what, I need this to be successful now because I don't want to go back to that kind of grind. I mean... It, just talk to me a little bit about that because it is a big jump to say, hey, you know, I'm put, I'm going all in on a very tough business in mixed martial arts. Oh yeah, man. Uh, my my whole mentality has just been, man, just bet on yourself, man. I I've, I've kind of been big on that for these last couple of years, and that's exactly what I've been doing. I've been betting on myself and uh, putting all the chips on my table and just being like, you know what, me, I believe in myself. I know I can do this, and I'm gonna go out there and keep proving it. And for me, like being being able to quit my full time job and uh, and be able to do MMA full time has been the biggest blessing to me. You know, so 2020 also helped me in that way. You know, getting that knockout, like the uh, first round knockout in my debut, and getting the and getting the bonus, like helped me like push even more to do what I truly love to do, and that's MMA. So to me, there's like absolutely no pressure because now this is a full time job for me. I I have like like it, like I said it on the contenders. It's like, man, I, I've been doing this as a part-time job. Let me do this as a full-time job. So, you know, my performance on the contenders is really good. And then, look, you see my my performance on uh on my debut, and it was really good. And it was really good. Uh, now it's now I have a full-time training camp, and now I feel more confident than ever. I feel like I'm gonna walk in there, and man, I'm a, like I feel like I'm gonna do some stuff that like I like I'm in really excited to, to put on a show like that's my biggest thing because man like for the past like after my my debut I was like I was just doing MMA full-time you know my job I quit my job like a week before uh, a week before uh, fight week for October 31st so like that was my last last day of working so whenever I was able to do it full-time I was like man now I'm a, now I'm gonna reap the benefits of me paying like betting on myself so it's not really more pressure. It's just me just doing what I do. Like I've been doing these past couple of years and betting on myself. And that's exactly what I'm keep on doing. I know he did have some words yesterday about not being impressed with the, you know, the names that you'd fought, but he did tell us earlier, he ran by you. I think at the PI, you guys had a little fist bump. Is there beef 
or is it just about the confidence you have in yourself? Oh, no, it's just the confidence to have in myself, man. And I, I, would, I expect for him to have the confidence within himself. You know, he, yeah, we did cross paths. You know, it's just like he got off the bus uh, from the shuttle going, coming from the PI, and then I was going to get on the shuttle going too. Uh, you know, it's like there's no animosity with me because at the end of the day, I, we both know we're going to have to step in the cage and we're going to go in there and fight. So for me, it, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, whether we have beef or we don't. You know, we can give each other a fist bump, man. I, like, even before, man, like, I I said it before in a press conference, I got all the respect in the world for that guy because, you know, he, like, he's a good fighter. I know what I have in front of me. He might be underestimating me a little bit, saying, like, all this hype and that, and, you know, he might be underestimating me. He wants to end my hype train. I, I don't believe I have a hype train behind me. I just believe uh, in my own skill set, you know, and that's what that's one thing that keeps me pushing forward and knowing that I'm going to go out there and perform. Uh, so for me, it's just more along the lines of like, man, I know what I have in front of me, and I respect it. There's, like, if he if he ha if he has the beef, or he, if it's up to him, you know, it's up to him, man. Uh, that's all on him. But you know, me, I'm cool, calm, and collected either way until we step in that cage, and I'm go we're going to go in there and put on a performance. Hey, thank you, Adrian, and best of luck. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll go next to Nikita with Sport Express. Your line is open. Nikita, your line is open. We will instead go to Zach with UFC.com. Okay. Man, I feel it's just going to be a rep representation of all the years and hard work that I put into this. Uh, 2020 was just a showcase. Uh, 2021 is just going to be me me building. Uh, like, like uh, man, I, I go back to this line that uh, Benny, the rapper Benny the Butcher said. You know, I go back to it every single time. He's like, last year was about branding. This one's about expanding. You know, that, that line stuck in my head. So literally, you know, 2020 was about me branding myself, me putting myself in the position I am today. And it, to me, like exactly what I did. I branded myself. I'm a UFC fighter. I went out there. I performed. Now it's time to expand on my, to expand, you know, and I'm putting all the chips in my basket. So, man, like I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to perform, especially with, uh, you know, like with myself, like full training camp, you know, I've, I've more confident than I've ever been. And I, f I feel really good heading into this performance. Where did you feel? Man, it was all both. It was both because, like, I knew whenever I had a full-time job, uh, I knew I wasn't getting enough training. I knew I wasn't having enough. So I always felt rushed. I always felt, like, stressed out. So it was, like, physically I knew that I wasn't as ready as I should be, but I was I was ready for I was ready for a fight, but I knew I wasn't as ready as I should be. Uh, and mentally it was just stressful because, like, man, my job, like, I'd get out, like, at 5, I'd get out, like, at 5 o'clock or 5.30. Uh, training would start would start at six. I'd had to rush to downtown Houston, uh, downtown Houston, which for me was a forty five minute drive. Depending on traffic, it'd be an hour drive. So it, I'd be like, literally like, tooth and nail, just like just barely getting there. And some days I'd be fifteen minutes late. So, man, it. So for a lot of a lot of time, it was real stressful. So it was both mental and physical. Uh, and then like you. Go out there. You're out working on the like a hot day, hot day at work, man. You don't have enough energy to go train, so it's 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 a lot that goes into it. So it's not just mental and physical. It's both mental and physical. So for me, it's like coming back from 2020 into 2021, man. It's like it's like man, like I got this like full training camp. I was able to get enough rest. I was able to get enough training. I was able to work on little things here and there. I was able to work advance on my techniques. Uh, man, I got my black belt like like in December, so I was like, so everything has been working out for me, is especially like it's been working wonders. So to me, man, like 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 I said, going back going back to before, like a betting betting on myself has been the biggest thing for me. Oh man, it's 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 like it's. For me, it's like living on a schedule, man. I, 
I I have to have everything down on a schedule. Like now it's like, like instead of going to work, having a schedule, doing that, and then going like going straight there, like everything is scheduled out. You know, I can now schedule in rest periods. I can now schedule in like when I need to go, like get something checked out. Like now I can schedule like, okay, well, you know, I, I can run this day. I can run this day at this time, this day I can run this day at this time. Uh, so it was just a lot more scheduling, being a lot, being being more flexible in my training and able to get a lot more rest. And then also, too, just being able to work on my mental, like on those rest times, because, you know, a lot of people, like people can get burnt out. You have a hard training session, you go back, you know, you're a little bit mentally uh, mentally exhausted. So, you know, it's, it's good to sit back and be able to uh, rest and just be able to, like, recoup and go back for another training session. So it's been all blessings for me, man. It's been the biggest blessing for me. Oh man, the expanding is keep on performing, keep on performing, uh, put on spectacular performances every single time I go out there. Well, whether it whether it's a KO submission or just the all round uh, domination or just like making it look flawless like Floyd Mayweather. So that's exactly what I what I would want to do is every single time I go out there, you know. And then on top of that, you know, the better the better the fight, you know, the better the knockouts, you know. And uh, like if I like if I go out there and I have a go go out there and have a war with Gustavo, or I stop him early, you know, depending on how that goes, that can build my brand and expand me. Like everybody's gonna be like, I want to watch that guy fight because he goes out there and he puts it all on the line, which I love to do. I love going out there and going blow to blow with the guy, but at the same time, I know myself. I want to get that knockout, and I'm going to get that knockout. Thank you very much, Adrian. You're all set. Cool. Thank you.
and they will do so. We are now joined by Montserrat Canejo. Montserrat, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. We'll take our first question from Gabriel Gonzalez with Kate Side Press. Your line is open. Hello, Montserrat. How are you? Hello. Good. Thanks. Can you tell us the story about getting the call to fight Cheyenne and make your UFC debut on short notice? Pues, eh, fue el día jueves cuando yo estaba llegando de correr, estaba desayunando. Maestro Víctor Dávila, que pues todos vivimos en una casa, somos roomies. Él me dio la noticia, salió de la habitación, me dio la noticia y estábamos los dos sorprendidos de que pues, no creíamos la, de la noticia y pues fue algo súper emocionante y estoy muy contenta de que UFC me haya dado la oportunidad. Thursday, uh, I just finished uh, my run that day, and I came out of his room and gave me feelable. I did about the experience. Uh, my second question, um, I don't know if you watched the scrum yesterday, but Cheyenne said she'd been helping Emily Dakota for her camp and said she's very familiar with what you are going to bring to the fight. I would just want to know your thoughts on her comments that she feels like she knows everything you're going to do. Pues, sé que es una peleadora que le, hablo, que le gusta hablar mucho, entonces, pues, vamos a ver si me conoce como ella dice y el sábado va a ser un día de guerra y le voy a pegar I know that she's the kind of fighter that likes to talk smoke. Let's uh, see if she really knows me. We're going to find that out on Saturday because on Saturday there's going to be a war. What are your thoughts on Cheyenne's game and what she can do as an opponent? ¿Qué piensas de Cheyenne? ¿Qué va a ser ella como oponente? Pienso que es una peleadora que va hacia enfrente su cinta negra en taekwondo, pero así como ella tiene su cinta negra en taekwondo, yo tengo mi luz. Y pues nada, solo pienso que es una oponente más en mi lucha. I think uh, she's uh, the kind of fighters that likes to go forward. I know she's a black belt in taekwondo, but uh, just like she's a black belt in taekwondo, I have my uh, background on Olympic wrestling, and uh, I know that uh, that can be uh, just her, her background. For a lot of fans, this is the first time they're going to see you. What do you want people to know about who are watching to know about you? Van a ver por primera vez. ¿Por qué se van a acordar de ti? Porque soy una peleadora que siempre va hacia enfrente. Me tendrán que matar para para poderme ganar. They're going to remember of me because I'm the kind of fighter that likes to go forward, and in order to finish me, they have to kill me. Uh, are you going to have your bunny teeth uh, mouthpiece for the fight? Vas a tener tu... Calma, Rapolita. Cal para la pelea de con eso. Solo dice wanna play. Ah, no, this one, I have this one that says wanna play. Gotcha. Uh, muchas gracias, Montserrat. Good luck. Thank you. You don't have details for the way in. <laughs> We'll go next to Alfredo Bush with Claro Sports. Your line is open. Hola, Conejo, ¿cómo estás? Hola, Hola ¿cómo muy está? bien, gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Qué bueno. Oye, eh, eh, cuatro, tú vas a ser apenas la cuarta mujer mexicana que, que suba al octágono. Eh, Jessica Aguilar, Irene Aldana eh, y también por ahí Alexa Grasso. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo te sientes tú de esa parte de seguir haciendo historia dentro de este deporte que es tan joven para, para México? Pues me siento muy feliz, muy honrada porque este, ya compañeras ya han abierto el, el camino hacia la, el MMA aquí. Vengo con un respaldo muy bueno de las MMA en México, entonces pues, vengo a representar con todo. Ese brinco que, que, que diste de, de calidad y demás, de dejar de entrenar en México, ahorita en eh, definitiva a Estados Unidos, eh, ¿qué tanto? lo has notado tú porque bueno evidentemente se, se ha visto en, en tu carrera tú, tú esa parte de, de decidir abrir camino irte para allá y dedicarte por completo a esto eh, cómo lo has a nivel personal tomado 
yo creo que me ha funcionado bastante bien esta persona. La calidad ha cambiado bastante. A, pues ser más responsable en lo que me gusta. Profesional en cuanto a tener una buena alimentación, en descanso, tener muchas distracciones. A veces eso también influye mucho en el grupo de gente con el que te rodeas. Es el momento de haberme mudado y estar eh, bajo, bajo el pelo de Víctor Dávila me ha servido bastante. Me rodeo con personas que siempre les gusta crecer, les gusta avanzar. Entonces, yo creo que si te juntas con campeones, vas a ser campeón. Yo creo que vas a ser muy bien. Sirve mucho este, el estar rodeado con gente positiva y gente que, que, te gust que le gusta ver que uno crezca. Y la última de mi parte, ¿cómo ha sido la semana de pelea? ¿Ha sido lo que te imaginabas? Eh, ¿Te imaginabas algo diferente? ¿O cómo has vivido esto estos días y lo que todavía falta, obviamente, con, con el pesaje y la pelea? Yo creo que cada pelea es un proceso diferente, pero llevo todo lo, el mismo sentimiento de cada pelea, ¿no? Todo, todo el proceso y, y creo que solamente ha sido distinto en cuanto el trato, ¿no? El trato hacia el peleador, todo, ¿no? En cuanto a calidad, calidad de trato y eventos, yo creo que es lo mejor que me ha pasado. Perfecto, pues mucha suerte, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias. We'll go next to Garcia Hernandez with Millennio. Uh, Garcia, your line is open. We'll go next to Augusto Niez Gay with Somos MMA. Your line is open. Montserrat, ¿cómo estás? ¿Todo bien? Hola, muy bien, gracias. Eh, bueno, eh, saludos a vos y a Víctor, que calculo que está ahí al lado oficiando de traductor también. Ahí está, iba a pedir eso justamente, que acerquen un poquito más el micrófono. Montserrat, eh, como primera pregunta, ayer contaste un poco lo que fue la reacción tanto tuya como la de tu entrenador, Víctor Dávila, al, al recibir la llamada, que, que él salió muy emocionado en calzoncillos a, a darte la noticia en, en la casa que comparten, pero quería, quería preguntarte en quién fue la primera persona en que pensaste o qué recuerdo vino a tu mente cuando, cuando te enteraste de eso, ¿no? Digo, de haber sido un momento muy, muy emotivo para vos, entonces, ¿en quiénes pensaste? Pues yo creo que pensé en mi familia, en mis padres, en mi mamá y mi papá, y, y luego se me vino todo así, todo mi recorrido que he hecho, y no sé, muchos sentimientos. ¿Y, y tus padres qué, qué dijeron cuando les diste la noticia? Imagino que lo llamaste ahí inmediatamente. No, me esperé porque pues todavía no sabía si lo podía este, hacer público y como mi papá es de esas personas que a todo mundo le quiere decir, entonces me esperé. Entonces yo cuando ya, ya sabía que sí, sí iba a hacer todo, le llamé a él, a mi mamá y no, pues súper emocionado, no se la creían, me decían, ¿de verdad? Yo sí. Y al final cuando colgamos, yo me puse a llorar, como que me dio mucho sentimiento porque pues, fue algo como muy emotivo, ¿no? Porque siempre han estado conmigo apoyándome. Y bueno, de eso, eso te quiero preguntar, ¿no? Imagino que para los padres no es algo fácil el hecho de ver a, a sus hijos pelear, subirse al octágono, pero calculo que, que ya deben estar acostumbrados, al menos de, después de la larga carrera que tenés, y que para esta oportunidad seguramente van a estar ahí del otro lado prendidos a, a, a la pelea. Sí, claro, cuando in, inicié en lucha, a mi papá pues no le gustaba, no quería, me decía, no, eso es de hombres, te van a matar. Y no quería, pero al fin de cuentas yo le dije, es algo que me gusta y pues debes de apoyarme. Porque me gusta. Y al final ya hasta me decía, ¿cuándo vas a pelear? Ya te quiero ver pelear. Y ahora hasta están ansiosos de que ya me quieren ver pelear. O sea, es algo que también les enamoró que, que, que yo este, haya decidido seguir en esto. Y bueno, también estoy viendo en redes sociales que ya hiciste las primeras fotos oficiales de la compañía. Entonces te quiero preguntar, ¿Cómo fue el momento en que te dieron la, la ropa oficial, en que recibiste el, el pantalón, la campera y, y todo con, con tu nombre? ¿Fue como, como impactante el hecho de decir, bueno, tengo el pantalón que dice mi nombre y UFC al lado? Sí, en cuanto vi que decía Conejo, dije, ¡ay, qué padre! <risa> es que creen que es mi apellido, pero, que diga mi apodo, pero es mi apellido. Y yo estaba esperando que sí dijera Conejo, porque es lo que me representa. Y vi la bandera y vi, y vi todos los colores y fue algo como que se me enchinó la piel y dije, ah, es, es mi armadura con la que voy a salir a, a pelear. 
Y bueno, en cuanto a, a la pelea, ¿no? Recién te lo preguntaban en inglés. Tu rival es compañera de, de Emily Ducot, que iba a ser justamente rival tuya el, el año pasado. Dijo que, que estuvieron entrenando juntas, que ya te conoce. ¿Es algo que te preocupa el hecho de que quizás ella haya tenido más tiempo viéndote o preparándose que vos que, que tomaste la pelea con, con unos días de anticipación? Yo creo que eso no, no me afecta en nada, pues al contrario, como sé que, que es este es compañera de Emily Ducote, pues lo que no le va a tocar a Emily lo va a pagar este Luis, entonces este es algo que pues ella ya me tiene ella ya está con ella piensa en mí, ¿no? Yo ya la tengo en la mente de que a lo mejor ella este, se está preocupando tanto en mí que, ya, que dice que ya me conoce, pero realmente no me conoce. El día, del, el, día del event, el día de la pelea va a ver que me va a conocer de verdad. Y, y te consulto, vos venís lógicamente de una base de jiu-jitsu, pero sabemos por, por, por lo que hemos visto en redes sociales, porque te hemos visto entrenando, que has afilado mucho tu striking. ¿Tenés algún método? O sea, decís, me gustaría terminar la pelea con una sumisión, con un knockout, o te da igual ganarla y, y, y ya? Pues claro que me encantaría terminarla con un, un, un knockout. En, en mi situación me gusta más terminar con sumisiones, pero si no funciona cualquiera de las armas, pues yo voy a, voy a ir siempre hacia el frente y matar o morir. Perfecto. Y mi última pregunta, Montserrat. Eh, por lo que se ve, te gustan mucho los tatuajes. Eh, quería saber si tenés pensado tatuarte algo referido a, a, a esta fecha o, no sé, a, a tu debut en UFC. Digo, es algo, un día importante para vos. No sé si lo tenías pensado o no. Pues no, no lo tenía pensado, este, pero posiblemente ahí me haga algo. Todo depende de, de, o sea, de, de, qué, de qué me vuelva a la mente, ¿no? Por el momento no estoy pensando en tatuajes. Perfecto. Gracias, Monserrat, y buena suerte el sábado. Muchas gracias. Thank you, guys. We'll go next to Pablo Santa Maria with Noti MMA Ecuador. Your line is open. Hola, Monserrat, ¿cómo estás? Hola, muy bien, gracias. Bueno, lo primero que quiero preguntarte es, ¿qué piensas sobre Chayanne como oponente? Pues... Pienso que es una peleadora que siempre va hacia enfrente. Eh, al igual que yo, voy a, voy a ir hacia enfrente. Entonces, pues, solamente pienso que es una peleadora que le gusta hablar de más. Entonces, el, lo que voy a hacer es callarle la boca y... Pues... Claro, y bueno, tienes victorias con knockout, victorias por sumisión. Eh, eres bastante completa. Entonces, ¿crees que eres mejor que ella en todas las áreas de las artes marciales mixtas? Pues yo creo que yo siempre me siento mejor, ¿no? O sea, yo me siento en mi óptimo estado, no puedo decir que soy mejor que alguien o, o así, pero yo voy a demostrar el sábado de lo que he estado trabajando. Claro, ¿y qué se siente tener a Master Vic como entrenador? Pues es algo bien chingón porque pues lo, lo puedo presumir siempre, ¿no? De que ah, él, él, es mi, él es mi Master Vic y... y yo sé que hay mucha gente que le gustaría entrenar con él. Entonces, yo, yo tengo el privilegio de, de entrenar con él y, y con Jocelyn, eh, estar juntos. Entonces, yo creo que es algo, algo muy, muy magnífico, ¿no? Tener este, alguien que tiene bastante experiencia en, en este ámbito. Entonces, yo creo que es súper genial. Claro. Eh, ¿Y alguna diferencia que sientas entre la semana de pelea entre Invicta y ahorita con UFC? Pues yo creo que es la única diferencia es de que voy a debutar en la mejor empresa del mundo. La única diferencia. Yo creo que cada, cada batalla o cada pelea tiene su preparación, tiene su todo tiene su costo, ¿no? Entonces yo creo que esto es un escalón más, es mi inicio. Y pues... Claro, y bueno, sabemos que vas a pelear en esta categoría que es bastante llamativa, tiene muy buenas peleadoras. Eh, muy pronto va a haber una pelea por el campeonato entre, entre Rose Namayunas contra Weili Shang. ¿Quién crees que va a salir victoriosa en esa pelea? Pues yo creo que Wei Shang es muy bueno. Viene muy, muy bien eh, mentalmente y físicamente viene muy bien. Claro, entonces muchas gracias por tu tiempo, Montserrat, y buena suerte en la pelea. Gracias. We'll take our final questions from Gracia Hernandez with Millennio. Your line is open. 
Hola, ¿qué tal, Monse? ¿Cómo estás? Hola, muy bien, gracias. Qué eh, bueno. Oye, pues una pregunta nada más ya para finalizar. Eh, has trabajado mucho para llegar hasta donde estás hoy. Cuéntame, ¿cómo ha sido este camino y cómo te sientes de tener por fin tu primera pelea en UFC este fin de semana? Pues sí, ha sido un camino muy largo, muy duro, difícil. Desde que inicié en lucha, llevo 13 años en el deporte. Ha sido tantos sacrificios de no ver a mi familia. Hubo momentos en que fallecieron familiares y no pude asistir. Entonces, son muchos sacrificios lo que uno tiene que pasar. Yo creo que cada peleador tiene su historia, cada quien pasa por algo. Pero mi historia es de que pues, fue muy, muy duro ¿no? para llegar a este momento, pero nunca desistí. Siempre, siempre soñé y anhelé con llegar a este momento y gracias a Dios me encontré con personas maravillosas que me ayudaron a, a conseguir ese sueño y pues, le agradezco bastante a Víctor Dávila, a Tori que siempre está ahí es, apoyándome, mi carnalito, y pues mi, mi equipo, mi team, es Planet 15 MM, siempre pues, me apoyan en cualquier pelea. Muy bien, pues sí, sí, me, me acuerdo pues, de toda tu trayectoria y, y pues finalmente, ¿cómo te sientes de, de por fin tener esta oportunidad de subir al octágono? Pues me siento muy contenta, muy feliz, es algo que he estado esperando bastante tiempo y, y yo creo que estoy ya emocionada de, de, de subirme a pelear y de demostrar de lo que todo, todo el, el proceso que pasé para llegar ahora. Perfecto. Muchísimas gracias, Monsi. Muchísimo éxito en tu pelea. Gracias. Thank you very much, Montserrat. Uh, you're all finished. Thank you. We will be joined next by UFC heavyweight Tai Tuivasa. We are now joined by UFC heavyweight Tai Toivasa. Tai, thank you very much for joining us today. How's it going? Very good, thanks. Uh, your first question will come from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Tai, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing good, man. My first question, you said yesterday you wanted to share a drink with him, to, you know, for saving the fight. I was wondering, did you hear that he'd given up drinking until he made it to the UFC? Oh, is that right? <laughs> like he's that, trying to commit that, to the cause. <laughs> so that means he can drink or can't drink? He can now. He's in the UFC taking your fight. There you go. From the short time you've had to watch him, what do you think about what he brings? Uh, I haven't uh, really watched him much. When you have a situation like this, then, I mean, how much is it just, you know, going in, I, I guess you could say, on instinct and just your own skills? Because there isn't a lot of time for tape and all that other stuff. <clears throat> uh, it's uh, where I'm from. I don't think you really get time to uh, see what the opponent has. So it's, I'm, I'm, it's a, this is the fight business. Uh, like I said, uh, thank you to him for, for being a fighter and stepping up, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of fighters these days don't want to don't want to do that. But um, man, this is the fight game. Everyone, everyone, we're gonna get in there and punch each other's heads in anyway. But it is. 
Happy belated birthday. On Saturday, where's the after party going to be at? And where can I get my invite? Definitely I ain't here. That's for sure. We're out of here. Somewhere on the strip. I don't know. Where's the after party? It'll be on, but... And my final question, um, you do, were you training back out here at AKA for this fight or were you back in uh, Australia? I was in Dubai, uh, TK MMA. Uh, I originally thought that uh, we were going to fight in Fight Island, but uh, I had it wrong. And just how is the situation over there? Because as things are changing slowly, I think with everything, did it open up? Was there a little more freedom with training like before? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't too sure about Australia and, and what was going to happen, whether we were going to lock it down or restrictions and this and that. So I, I, made, the, I made the call to go to Dubai and uh, Dubai is pretty, pretty open and they're pretty free. You can do what you want, pretty much. You just got to wear a mask. I don't really like wearing masks anyway, so. Who does really, right? It's uh, best of luck and thank you for the time. Thank you, brother. We'll go next to Zach with UFC.com. Um, I'm here to I'm here to win. To get my money for my the way, like I said, it's pretty much the same game plan, doesn't matter who I fight. I come to win. Prepared myself. Let's let's rock. It's gonna be uh... uh right now I wanna go home, see my son. It's been a long time. I miss him so much, you know, he's his ball now, so missing out on a lot of things. But uh, to be honest, I hope this COVID fucks off and we, <laughs> I don't know, and the world opens up or I don't know what's going on, man, but shit. Feels like, you know, it could be fucked on the back end. No, but you're still young in the team. To be honest, uh, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, I'm 28, 28 now, yeah. That seems old now. But I'm 28. I never really did martial arts growing up. I didn't, uh, you know what I mean? So I've been learning on the run. And uh, I think that's the best way to learn. Uh, so I feel like I've got many more years in me to fight. I'm still learning. Still learning more about my diet. Still learning more about jiu-jitsu. Still learning more about discipline. But I think I'm going to be like wine, you know what I mean? Get better with age. So, uh, after your last fight, you're like, looking for trying to find <clears throat> Have you already got the plan down? And, you know... I hope Uncle Dana's got some halo or something there or whatever it is and throw that in some shoes. Or I don't know. I'll miss the crowd. Bring the crowd back, man. Bring the crowd back. I need some dirty shoes. So. All right. Thank you very much, Ty. You're all set. Done. Yeah, all good. Man. Take a hell of a headshot today. We will be joined shortly by UFC welterweight Song Kanan. We are now joined by UFC welterweight Song Kanong. As a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press the hand icon.
Song, thank you for joining us today. Hello. Hello. Uh, 他说谢谢你今天参加这个媒体会 uh, We will take our first questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press uh, 现在是第一个记者对你进行访问 Hello Song My first question How has this fight week experience been with the travel and being quarantined in the hotel compared to your past fights? Um, 他说这一场比赛就是你很远的旅行过来然后在酒店进行隔离这个经验跟你之前的比赛经验有什么区别吗 Okay, uh, and someone is saying that this time what's different is they can only have um, activities within the hotel area, and after his way in, he can only get um, food um, from uh, DoorDash, kind of like that, so it's very different. Does he like it because it's a little quieter, there's not as much, or does he prefer having more of the freedom? 嗯，他说就是你会更喜欢这样子，更安静一些，还是说你想要就是像以前更多的自由一点？我比较喜欢像以前一样，像以前一样的话，我们能出去通过体重之后能到外面去吃东西。Okay, uh, he prefer um from previous, so they could go out and enjoy the food and stuff. We know the UFC is looking to return to Asia this year. What would it mean to you to fight back home in a big event, especially because it would probably be one of the first events with a full crowd in attendance? Um, 他说就是今年UFC计划想要回到亚洲去举办比赛,特别有可能还是会有观众的,所以对于你来说,有什么意义,就如果你能够当主场去比赛的话。我觉得到主场比赛的话，自己的这个精神状态应该会更好，因为经常会有很多。嗯，hello。啊，没听清吗？啊，对，可以重复一下吗？我觉得就是如果在在那个在自己的主场比赛，而且有现场的话，我自己
What are your thoughts of a victory? Where does the victory get you to? What is next getting this victory? Uh, Okay. Um, he think it maybe could be a submission um, or maybe full three rounds. And if he get this victory, he wants to uh, match up with um, more competitive fighters. And you mentioned about doing some training in the United States. Did you train for this fight in the United States at any time? And if so, where? Mm. 就是你刚刚提到说你在美国有训练过那么你为这场比赛准备有在美国训练还是怎么样如果是的话在哪里这场比赛我是一直留在上海的皮埃进行训练我是在前提前两个星期过来适应一下这边吃茶跟嗯但
Yeah, look at me. Take the hat, look at the brush. We are now joined by number 15 ranked USC lightweight, Gregor Gillespie. Gregor, thank you very much for joining us today. How you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, first question will come from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Gregor, can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. Uh, Gregor, my first question, with everything that went on in 2020, being in Long Island, I mean, how did you handle the training situation throughout the year? Because between lockdowns and everything changing, I'm assuming it was quite an experience. Yeah, Long Island was a tough place to be in, considering we're, you know, 20 miles or less away from the New York City area. So it was, it was tough. Um, but the first, I would say, I guess, four or five months of, you know, once lockdown started. So from like March to, I guess, July-ish, I was upstate New York with my family, my girlfriend, all my friends up there. I was kind of sitting up there waiting for things to open back up in Long Island because, you know, if I'm not going to be able to work, if I'm not going to be able to train, I wasn't really going to stay in Long Island. So I went upstate for an uh, extended period of time and doing, you know, solo workouts in my brother's basement for a while and got old quick. You already bring such a dangerous weapon with your wrestling and your grappling. With all of this time between fights, what kind of growth did you want to make sure you made in your game in these months where we haven't seen you? I don't think we needed to reinvent the wheel. Um, There's a few things we needed to tighten up with the kickboxing. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot. You know, we stayed on the same training regiment and we did a lot of, you know, striking work, which we've always done. We didn't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, it was unfortunate what happened last fight. But as I said yesterday in a few interviews, um, you know, it, I didn't get caught. I didn't get unlucky. It was just, you know, a perfectly executed combo by Kevin Lee, and that was the result. So, again, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We just kept training hard the way we were always training. I had just one question about, you know, obviously the way the last one went down. We've heard several fighters discuss after they've ended up on the highlight reel. You kind of just got to own it and just to be able to move past it. For yourself, what was that process to like, you know, yeah, I've seen that clip everywhere. It's behind me now, though. I have a really funny story about that clip, actually. So um, I was going up state where my facial doctor was because I did break my jaw as a result of that kick with Kevin Lee. And I was going up, you know, for my, I don't know, sixth or seventh uh, facial doctor visit to get clearance to go back to full-time training with contact. And I was upstate and it was, it happened to be the UFC Brasilia fight where Kevin Lee was fighting uh, Charles Oliveira. And I was at a ski resort, which actually that day the ski resort got shut down for the whole year. And it was kind of the start of the whole lockdown thing. But I was at uh, I was at the bar, hanging out with my buddies between you know, time up and down the uh, the mountain, and uh, the bartender knew that I was a fighter, and she was you know, kind of saying, hey everyone, this is a UFC fighter, blah blah blah, and they were that was on a Sunday, and they were replaying the fight from the night before, which was Kevin Lee versus Oliveira, and of course that was Kevin Lee's last fight, so right as she's telling everyone that um, you know I'm a, a fighter the highlight of Kevin Lee knocking the outcomes on TV and, oh man, they could have picked a better one, you know, but yeah, I mean, that was obviously, you know, unfortunately I'm going to be highlight reel for Kevin Lee forever. And, you know, listen, if you fight long enough, things like that happen. So uh, I don't think I, it took too long to get over that. Um, it was something that happened. It's part of my fighting experience and, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to not let that happen again. Well, I certainly hope they were nice to you at that bar, Gregor. Um, yeah, they were. <laughs> awesome. Uh, my final question, how do you get this victory on Saturday against Brad? Same game plan as always. So watch my first six fights. That's what I'm looking to do. Hey, thank you and best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> we'll go next to Damon Martin with MMAfighting.com. Your line is open. Hey, Gregor, uh, you know, I know as a wrestler, you know, you guys go through losses, you guys go through, you know, tough times. And, and I know, you know, part of the mentality of wrestling is, you know, embracing the grind and coming back out there and getting, you know, getting getting back on the horse, so to speak. Uh, with the pandemic and, and the injury, was it tough this last year and a half, you know, not being able to compete? Because I, I imagine that probably eats away at you a little bit. Yeah. So like you mentioned before, uh, this is not the first time I've experienced a loss. Um 
I had double digit losses in my high school career and I had double digit losses in my college career. So this is not the first time I've had to come back from a loss. Unfortunately, the difference and people probably, you know, the people that are really involved involved in the sport do understand this. But for anyone that doesn't, the difference between losing in wrestling and then losing in fighting um, is the fact, and this could be a double-edged sword. You know, this is, it's a blessing and a curse, but after you lose in wrestling, typically you're going to wrestle that same day or the following day, and you can kind of redeem yourself and feel okay or more okay about the loss relatively quickly. Um, you know, if you lose in wrestling and then the next day or the next round, you beat a good guy, you kind of are, it's a little damper. Uh, on the loss from the previous round. In fighting, you're waiting months, years in this case, uh, well, a year or so in this case, before you can even attempt to redeem yourself. So, yeah, that's um, that's the tougher part about fighting is, uh, you know, you're only as good as your last performance, and uh, you, you kind of got to wait a while before you can redeem yourself in most instances in fighting. Uh, not to you know keep uh, harping on the wrestling, but you know having talked to guys like Kyle Snyder, like after he lost a match, you know it, it fired him up pretty hard. He wanted to come back out there and compete that much more. Because you come from wrestling, I imagine it's kind of the same thing. But kind of give me that mentality coming back from the loss and going into this fight. Like, do you get fired up? Do you do you have to kind of put that out of your mind a little bit? Like, how do you approach it? Yeah, I mean, my college coach uh, Tim Flynn told me this a long time ago. Whether you win or whether you lose. You have to have amnesia. And I remember those were his exact words. So if you come off of a really good win, um, you can't just sit there and celebrate and pat yourself on the back because the next round you got another killer who's trying to take you out. Uh, and if you lose, and then you have to go back to the wrestlebacks and try to beat another good guy who's trying to get on the podium, you can't dwell on the loss that you just had either. So uh, you have to have you know, amnesia about your last round or last fight. That almost a perfect segue to the next question because you do see it. You know, some guys, some girls, when they experience a knockout, you know, they they come back trigger shy. They come back, you know, gun shy to go out there and engage. And obviously, Brad Riddell is a, is a striker. I don't think it's any giant secret what he's going to try to do in this fight. Uh, but you seem like a pretty mentally strong guy. Obviously, you've addressed the loss. You've addressed what happened. In terms of that, like in terms of this matchup, like is this almost the perfect fight for you to go out there against a the guy who you kind of know is going to try to knock you out? Yeah, I mean, it's a fight. Um, I think most guys at this point in my career, uh, especially the ones that I've fought already, um, you know, they're going to try to stop my takedowns and try to hit me on our feet or kick me on our feet. It's no different than the last seven fights I've had in the UFC. You know, no one really wants to do the grappling exchange with me. That's always been the case from, you know, the local promotions up through my uh, fights in the UFC. So it's no different, you know, got to get to where I'm good. And that's not a secret either. And last one for me, because you did have to go through so much to come back with, as you mentioned, the jaw injury and then the time off with the pandemic. Uh, I know it's tough to answer with the fight literally two days away, but if everything goes well on Saturday night, how busy would you like to be? Can I imagine you want to, you know, kind of get a busier schedule for the rest of this year? Sure. But let's talk about that one after this weekend. I, uh, I really I just focus on the next one. That's how I've always been. Uh, I don't want to start making predictions of what's going to happen after I really uh, I got to focus on the fight in, you know, two days or so. Thanks, Gregor. You got it. We'll go next to Pablo Santa Maria with No T MMA Ecuador. Your line is open. Hi, Gregor. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. The first thing I want to ask you is it's been a long time since we saw you in action. So what did you learn from that fight from Kevin Lee? <sighs> I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? So. Of course, everyone and their brother was telling me after that I should have wrestled sooner. I should have pushed the wrestling action. And it's very easy for everyone, including myself, to say, yeah, I should have wrestled sooner. But what if I had knocked him out? Because the striking, I, you know, from you know, how I felt about it, I was winning the exchanges. Uh, it was close, but I, I felt like I was winning the exchanges on our feet. Um, so what if I'd knocked him out? Then everyone would have been praising my striking and saying, we're glad you didn't wrestle, you know? So it's, it's uh, hindsight's 2020, but what if I had pushed the wrestling too soon where a shot wasn't there, dove in on a shot and got an uppercut or need or whatever, and got knocked out. Then everyone would have been telling me, you know, why were you forcing the wrestling? Your striking was going so well, you know? So it's very, very easy to look back and say, well, I should have done this. I shouldn't have done that after, you know, the outcome. So, you know, what I've learned, um, 
you know, I guess get to where you're good sooner if the opportunity is there. But, you know, there's no need to force anything. For sure. And what are your thoughts of Brad Riddell as an opponent? Yeah, I, I've always been uh, the kind of guy who stays away from talking about my opponents. Um, he's obviously a good fighter. Um, you know, I know he's good. I know he's going to have a lot of effort. Um, I know he's going to try really hard. Uh, he's not the kind of guy who's going to roll over. So, you know, I, same game plan I've always had. You know, I'm going to push the action. I'm going to make it uh, a high-volume fight. So. Okay, so you're fighting in one of the most stacked divisions in the UFC, if not the most stacked. So uh, what are you feeling of fighting at lightweight division? And if you get the victory, you would like, would like to call someone out? Uh, no, I'd like to go fishing after I finish my fight. <laughs> and, uh, I'd like to... Uh, do a little mountain climbing after too. I've been, uh, I would say it, it, the one thing that I did pick up as a hobby in the last, uh, however long I've been off was, uh, my girlfriend got me into climbing mountains. So there's another obsession that, uh, I got to juggle as well as my fishing. So I'm going to be busy this week after climbing mountains and fishing. Okay. I think for me, it's a lot is talking social media. How do you handle the lot? Will you have a, and advice for all the defeated fighters are at putting excuses, like for example, Chang O'Malley, he's undefeated, or Paulo Costa, he drank too much wine. But you talk it like a like a champion. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for anyone but myself, but I didn't lose that fight against Kevin Lee because I had an off night, or I, you know, I I kept my hands too low, or he caught me, or. He got uh, lucky. No, none of that's true. So to say that stuff would just be, you know, like you said, making excuses. But I, I can't speak for anyone but myself. But um, one thing I can say is that when I see people who, after a loss, can't even, like, fathom the thought of giving credit to the other guy, that really irks me. Um, you know, these guys are good. You didn't have an off night, man. The other guy eat you he was the better man that night so and the inability to express that or accept that 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 rubs me the wrong way so maybe i go a little too far the other way but like you know these guys are really good and you know he executed a perfect game plan so if i can't address that and, and say that that was something that he did well then i mean I, how are you going to ever personally grow you know for sure. Okay, it's awesome to have you back in the Octagon. Good luck in the fight. Thank you. And thanks for your time, girl. I appreciate it. And we'll take our final questions from Nikita with Sport Express. Your line is open. Hey, Gregor. Big pleasure to talk to you. My man. How you doing? In 2009, you beat Michael Chandler in NCAA. I wonder, what memories do you have about this wrestling match, about Michael, and what uh, catches your mind, you know? Oh, my God, that was a lifetime ago. Um, yeah, I wrestled Michael Chandler in the 2009 NCAA Division I tournament. And I, 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 it, was, uh, I believe it was the consolation semi-round. And I, I don't remember the exact score, but um, I think it was something like 12 to 2. But that score was, I don't want to say misleading, but I do remember thinking like, holy cow, man, most people, when they're losing by eight or nine points, they stop trying so hard. He had like, a, like he was just kept coming and kept pushing the pace. And, you know, uh, I was definitely the better guy at that point. And I, you know, weathered that storm and I put my points up on the board. But I remember thinking like, holy shit, dude, this guy just doesn't stop. But, you know, that was, uh, that was a long time ago. Um, I think we've both made improvements in our fighting and our grappling or whatever you want to say since then, you know. Uh, Gregor, since uh, that time, were you surprised later that Michael Chandler went too far in MMA, that he achieved so much uh, success in this sport? No, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, he was a Division One All-American in college wrestling. It's like if you learn how to use your hands into your takedowns, and he's actually predominantly a striker at this point. He gets, I think, more knockouts, finishes on his feet than he does any, you know, any time on the ground. Um, that part, I guess, would kind of surprise me, but, I mean, I'm not surprised that he's winning. Uh, when people are combat athletes and they win, they usually continue to win. Um, 
that's one thing about the best guys. And I've always said that I, I put myself in this category as well. Uh, winners, no matter what, continue to win. And for example, like Ben Askren is not a boxer, but I'm certain Ben Askren's going to figure out a way to win in his fight against uh, Jake Paul or against Jake Paul. Yeah. But like winners usually win no matter what uh, avenue they're heading down. So I'm not surprised Michael Chandler is winning either. No. Uh, Gregor, I have uh, several questions about the Kevin Lee fight. Uh, at that first round, before knockout, there was a moment when he threw head kick and he missed, but it was very close. In that moment, maybe you had feeling that, man, I should be more accurate with his kicks. How do you remember that? I mean, I, I do remember, I believe it was a right kick that he missed. Um, uh, I, obviously, we had trained blocking kicks. I think everyone, when they're training for a fight, no matter who it's against, um, they train to block kicks and fire back, right? Counter punch, counter kick. Um, but the one thing I guess that was uh, a little more surprising is from what I understood before that fight, he usually went southpaw before he threw that kick. This time he did it right off of a right hand. Um, Oh, but I mean, again, props to Kevin Lee. Perfectly executed, perfectly timed. I mean, nothing lucky about that. It was as good as it gets. Although this fight uh, didn't play out good for you, but I were uh, admired a little bit your jab because your jab in this fight uh, worked very well. You uh, have cut. Yes, he has cut under his eye. Uh, can you a little bit tell about your jab because you're a fast guy? and you have very strong jab. How it's uh, is this important weapon for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've always had a good jab. Um, I should have kind of segued that and parlayed that into uh, some, some follow-up punches. If I had to say the one thing that I wish I had done differently as far as my striking was concerned in that fight, uh, one punch at a time doesn't usually get it done. Um, so that's something we've worked on. Uh, yeah, but my jab, yeah, I don't think it's a secret. I have a pretty decent jab. Uh, Gregor, you, in terms of height, you're a little bit small for this division, even for 145 division. Uh, how you can deal with knees? Because we saw in Frank Edgar, Corey Sanhagen fight this terrifying knee. How can you deal with uh, that knee uh, threats? Um, well, uh, I really don't even know how to answer that. I mean, I'm as tall as I am, right? Uh, I don't have like a horrible time getting down to 155, but I am, you know, cutting some weight to get there. Um, I will say this for everyone that, you know, gives me shit about why don't you go down to 145. I mean, it, that'd be a pretty tough cop for me. I'm not sure that I would, you know, be interested in doing that at this point. And usually when people decide to go down, it's because they're losing and maybe it's because of the size. Um, the reason I lost my last fight wasn't, because I was the smaller man. I got kicked in the head. It was a perfectly executed shin across my face. That had nothing to do with me being small for the weight class. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the other guys weigh on fight night, but I can't imagine that they weigh much more than I do on fight night. So uh, I don't think that I'm undersized for the weight class, and I'm certainly not the reason that I lost my last fight. So um, I always try to steer clear of the whole topic of why aren't I down a weight class. So, I mean, I ended my college career at 157. I'm, you know, now two pounds lighter than that in a weight class, two pounds lighter than that. And, you know, this is where I'm staying. Gregor, you have 23 takedowns in UFC already. It's very cool. Um, can you recollect the most memorable takedown in UFC? Maybe the most beautiful, you're most proud of? Oh, man. Um, I had several good takedowns against uh, Gonzalez. I think it was my third fight in the UFC. Yeah, uh, yeah it was at Pittsburgh. I had several good takedowns um, during that fight that I thought I, I ran my feet well. I didn't hesitate on the finish. I had clean entries uh, off of punches. I thought those were probably some of my best takedowns uh, right into finishing. I'd, I'd say that's, I had, I think probably, I, I, probably seven or eight takedowns that fight if I had to guess. Gregor, my last question is about fishing. Uh, have you ever felt bad after you caught fish and you unhooked it and returned to water? Has there ever been such moment? Have, have I felt what? 
you felt bad that you caught fish and you returned her to water, release, you know? It has never been so Are you saying that I feel bad? Yes, yes, maybe, you know, a little bit that you caught. It. No, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I never keep the fish that I catch um, unless someone specifically asks me, hey, if you're going salmon fishing today, could you bring me back one? And uh, otherwise, I never bring fish home with me. Um, I catch release and they're 99% of the time they're released alive. Um, so that's something that, you know, I, I'm pretty proud of. I don't, you know, kill the fish and, or leave them on the beach or whatever, you know, we're very, uh, very responsible with our fishing. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Gregor, thank you very much. Best luck. On the I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gregor. You're all set. Cool. Thank you.
I, you don't want to say that. <laughs> we are now joined by number nine ranked UFC women's bantamweight, Marianne Renault. Marianne, thank you very much for joining us today. Having me. First questions will come from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cage Side Press. Your line is open. Hello, Marianne. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, my first question, can you walk us through getting that call that you had tested positive and just that immediate aftermath that pushed back the fight? It was, uh, it was about 7.30 that morning. They had called me, and I'm like, wait a minute. Nobody calls me from the UFC at 7.30 in the morning, and I'm like, this, this is probably not good news. And I answered the phone, and unfortunately, I had tested for COVID, and my heart literally just dropped. I was... I was completely devastated because I had felt fine. I was just at a point where I was just like, God. So when I spoke with my manager, you know, because I ended up giving him a call, he's like, let's have a plan. Let's let them know, you know, hey, we want to fight here. We don't want to wait um, two months later. We want to fight about this date since you feel fine. So we were able to let them know, let the matchmakers know when we wanted to fight and set up something for us. So. It was a good, it was, it was bad and then it was good. So here we are. Did you deal with any symptoms afterward or were you more asymptomatic? I was, I felt a little groggy the next day and I didn't, I wouldn't stay in the house. I was like, nope, I'm going to go out for a run. So I took my dogs, we went out for a run. And I think the, besides feeling groggy that day, I had no taste and smell, which was, dev I, that was terrible. I, not being able to taste or smell anything. And then when you did eat stuff, tasted sour like an orange. It just tasted like it was rotten. So I think that was one of the main symptoms that I got. When you have a situation like this, so same opponent, you did the whole camp, but now the fight gets moved back. What kind of things do you go back to work on in the gym? Because technically speaking, all the work was already done before the first fight day, right? So what was it to go back to train? We just stay on course. You know, we were set to peak at that time. So we come down slowly and then we try to re-engineer our camp to peak again. And so that's basically what we stayed on. We stayed on our timing. We stayed on um, our game plan and what we wanted to work on, you know, just for the most part, just staying sharp. I know you also work, obviously, as a teacher with more schools reopening. Uh, what's your situation? Are you seeing your students again soon? Or what? where is it at at the school you teach at? So before I flew out, we had an emergency meeting with a lot of the teachers and the administration, and they let us know that April 6th um, for the school that I work for, that they, they were going to open it up. So all next week when I get back, it's going to be all about planning and getting the, the kids back, but it's not to a regular schedule. I have about 40 kids in each one of my classes, and I'll only get to see 14 of them at a time. Um, the others will still remain on distance learning. So it's still kind of a weird situation. It's not idea, but at least it's something to normalcy. Well, congratulations, certainly. I'm sure it's going to be very nice to see everyone and just have that interaction again. Uh, Marion, I would be remiss if I don't ask this. It has not gone your way the last few fights. Quite simply, is this a back against the wall, do or die situation for your time in the UFC? You know, I've been told just to, you know, keep moving forward as a heptathlete or a collegiate heptathlete. You know, you had seven events and two, in two days to do those seven events. And if you had a bad event, you could, that was something that you couldn't focus on because you had to gear up and get ready for the next event. So as I move forward, you know, not thinking, I, I see that they're back there. I see that those fights, they were, they were good fights um, and they did not go my way, but that's not something that I'm going to harp on and hey, this one's all my do or die. I'm going into this fight with the same mentality. I have to get in there, I have to win. That's my job. So I'm not focused too much on the previous fights. I gotta let those go. I can't dwell on it. I gotta let that pass go and just keep moving forward. Thank you, Marion, and best of luck. Thank you. We'll take our next questions from Zach with UFC.com. Um, so obviously, oh. you have a, a nice What have you seen from her? Well, she was the fighter. 
champion, obviously, at 145. She's long, she's tall, she's lanky, she likes to clinch, and so, you know, that's kind of um, what we've seen from her. Say that again? I can barely hear you. Mm, I'd, I'd say, you know, during um, peak moments when either I'm moving forward on them or my back is up against the wall, I feel that um, things that we've done to drill in the past, I mean, they just kind of are put together in the spur of the moment. I'm always underrated and overlooked. I, it's, I honestly, until you said it, I wouldn't have known who was a favorite or not. It's not something that I look up. It's not something that I concern myself with just because I've always been the underdog. We'll go next to Jim Barcelone with the Miami Herald. Your line is open. Oh. Uh, thank you. I, curious, as a teacher, what has it been like as a fighter and as a teacher? And are you like the cool teacher because you are a fighter with the students? I like to think I'm the cool teacher. I think um, they don't know what to think of me just because I'm a little, I'm very animated. I'm very loud. I'm very in your face, let's go movement. So I sometimes when they look at me, they're like, God, you're drinking too much coffee, Ms. Renault. I think you need to slow down on the coffee. And I'm like, that's just naturally me. So I like to think I'm the cool teacher. <laughs> what has it been like for you being a part of UFC and continuing this journey? You know, it's, I, I cannot complain. I feel that being a part of this journey has set me up for where both myself and my husband are now in our lives, where we were able to open up our own gym and you know give a give back to our community not only to the adults but the kids in our community especially during this time so i feel that this journey has just opened so many doors our my dots are starting to connect where they need to be and and if you would have asked me gosh, 15 years ago if i foreseen this in my future i was in a bad spot i would have said no this this has leveled me out this movement this whatever Whatever God had planned for me, it, it's worked. And for this particular fight, who will be in your corner? Did you do? Did you have anyone different with your training team brought in for this fight or business as usual? Pretty much business as usual. We made a couple of adjustments with one of the corners, felt a little bit more comfortable. Uh, so I'll be joined with by Michael Craddock, Jim West, and then also my husband, Armando Perez. All the best and thank you. Thank you very much, Marion. You're all set. It, awesome. <laughs> we will be joined shortly by number seven ranked UFC middleweight, Derek Brunson. We are now joined by number seven ranked UFC middleweight, Derek Brunson. Derek, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. First question will come from Ezekiel Bergonzi with Somos MMA. Your line is open. Hello, Derek. How are you? Uh, what's up? I'm good. 
My first question is, how do you feel going to this fight? Do you feel like you are being underestimated by the five fight uh, with streak record of Kevin Holland? Um, it doesn't really matter to me. I haven't really been focused on all that stuff. My focus for this camp has been preparation and worrying about myself. Um, I'm ranked number seven. He ranked number 10. He's trying to take my spot. So uh, it's just business to me. And how do you prepare for this fight? Uh, the same as always, you know, just worried about bettering myself. Uh, I was down at Sanford MMA for four weeks training with, with those guys down there, getting ready for the fight. Uh, we had a great camp, and here we are. You have a three-win streak, so how do you think that a, a Kev, a beating Kevin Holland will put you on the rankings? Uh, just me doing what, holding my spot, you know. Um, these young, hungry guys, they're coming from my spot. They're coming to take where I'm at, you know. So I got to hold my spot. And with an impressive victory, I believe I can leap a lot of guys in the rankings and really can put myself in the thick of things uh, with a title. Uh, talking about the title, uh, Israel Adesanya fought uh, Sean Blachowicz for the light heavyweight championship, and he lost. So how do you think that will affect the middleweight division? Do you think that... Uh, Israel Adesanya defeat was better for the, the 185 division or not? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, my focus is only at division at 185. So whatever it takes for me to work myself closer to the title, that's what I'm focused on. He went up there, tried to get to 205. He didn't succeed. Now he's back at 85, and that's look like that looked like where he's going to stay. So uh, that's where, where the fights will line up. My last question is, uh, Kevin Holland said a couple of minutes ago that he sent you a lot of DMs. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that uh, that is a strategy to get into your head, or do you think that he's just like that and it doesn't matter for you? Uh, he tried to. He tried to get in my head. Uh, Kevin Holland's just a class clown, you know, so I let him do his thing. You know, he's, he's a class clown. He tried to be funny, but it doesn't matter. You can talk. You cannot talk. You can be silent, you can be outspoken, but the way I'm coming to knock people out, you know, I'm coming to get finishes. So that's not going to change one way or the other, you know. I'm, I'm coming to get wins. So um, I'm focused on the task at hand, and that's that. Thank you very much, and good luck on Saturday. Thank you. We'll take our next questions from Gabriel Gonzalez with Cape Side Press. Your line is open. Hey, Derek, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Thank you. Derek, so you've got this nice win streak together, and I heard you address this a little bit about how the fans can be up and down depending on a fighter's last performance. When you had that rough patch, you know, two and four, how did you filter out that noise to just focus on working on yourself? Because I know it can't always be easy, especially when you're in a public job like fighting on TV. Well, um, a couple of those losses was just kind of, not being properly pre prepared, and also I got a little unlucky with the judges. So, you know, um, you just got to stay focused on the task at hand, and that's what I, I tend to do. Um, you're only as good as your last fight, as as the fans will see it in MMA, you know, and combat sports. So I always focus on that next fight and really focus on that one and taking care of that one. With that, you've obviously got so many weapons. You're wrestling, you're very durable, you're very dangerous with your power. So when you change teams and everything, how much is it an X's and O's standpoint in terms of learning just uh, your craft? And how much of it is mental in terms of turning the corner like this? It's a little bit of everything, you know. It's, it's about, you know, just properly executing, game planning. Um, more so is just being pushed, having the bodies, the people training full time who are at the highest level to push you. I think I heard an interview this week. GSP was saying, you know, once you become really famous, make a lot of millions, um, it's easy to lose your edge. And the only way to lose, to get your edge back is to get challenged. And you have to step away from your team and get challenged by guys who are not, you know, trying to baby you or take care of you. There's guys that's coming to get you, you know, that's going to push you in training and stuff like that. And that's at that level to ultimately bring out the best in you. Was there a moment where it just kind of clicked? Like, you know, you talked about, you know, being more patient in there and executing the way you need to. Was there a moment where you realized, like, you know what? It's coming to me now. It's just feeling more natural to do that now. 
Uh, no, it was just more looking at myself in the mirror, like, all right, stop being stupid. You know, stop being out there rushing everything. Take your time, slow it down, articulate. Don't be out here being in a rush. You know, you got X amount of time. You could knock somebody out in the same amount of time by setting it up, opposed to just trying to rush them. You know, so this is just about, you know, growing in the sport and really embracing being a martial artist. In the next few weeks, it's obviously a very big month for the middleweight division. You know, have you thought about, you know, who and when, you know, you'd want your next fight to be, or are you just pushing that aside for now? Um, I've seen, it, it's been a, it'd be kind of like a bad thing to kind of lock in on any one person because things have been changing. Um, Costa was supposed to fight Whitaker. That fell through and got some stuff in. So things are constantly changing. So the, the best thing to do in this division is kind of focus on the fight at hand and then after that, see what's up. Hey, thank you, Derek, and best of luck. Thank you. We'll go next to Jim Barcelone with the Miami Herald. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you so much. Sanford MMA, Henry Hooft and everybody there in here in South Florida, just incredible. And I wonder if that correlates. You've won your last three fights. And was that when, before that first of those three, when you started with Sanford MMA? How much of a connection has it been with your growth with Sanford MMA in your last few fights? I hope I have the timeline right. Well, yeah, so I started, my win streak uh, is indicative of the time that I've been at Sanford. So the first fight, I was at Sanford second and third. So we're on a three fight winning streak ever since I started training down there. So it, it's just good bodies down there, good coaches down there. Everybody's pushing and yeah, it's, it's good vibes. So every day, you know, you're in the gym making gains or understanding where you're at and things you need to improve on. And if I can, how did that connection start for you to get to Sanford and just getting with them and being able to be there? How did that work for you to get there? Well, I, I knew a lot of the guys. You know, I've been in this game for a while. Um, I saw Henry Hoof at a lot of events, and he would always, you know, speak to me, say what's up, even, you know, when I was with another team. He would just say hi, you know, say good job, or, you know, he's just a really friendly guy, you know, and I've seen how all his guys had clean striking, and it was close to home. So, you know, I was like, you know, that's an opportunity I got to jump on. Really want to go down and train with those guys. I went down for a week to try it out, and then, yet I was hooked, definitely. And then I came back for camp, and it, I've been there since, you know. What has it been like, too, working with the other fighters and everyone there? Because you mentioned, I mean, I know South Florida just overall, not just Sanford, but there's a lot of good fighters and coaching down here. What has it been like for you to be involved in that and just see your game elevate like that and then gaining that confidence. Yeah, it's, this game is always changing. And, you know, um, the guys that I came in the sport with, a lot of guys are not fighting still, you know? So all these young guys that a lot of people don't know a lot about who are going to be stars, you know, within a year or two, it's good to have these young guys pushing you every day, you know? It, it just gets you ready for these big fights. And were you there when it was Hard Knocks 365 and then made the transfer over to Sanford MMA? So my question on that part is, okay, my question is, what do you think of the new facility? <laughs> yeah, I was there at Hard Knocks 365. Uh, it was a, it was a sweat sweat place, you know. I used to love cutting weight there or getting ready for fights because my weight was real low. But uh, the not, the new place, Sanford MMA, is phenomenal. It's like state of the art. They got doctors, they got a recovery room, sauna, nice everything. It's just like you know, they have everything for that a fighter would need to recover to get healthy. Like one guy blew his knee out, and they have doctors. He got a, went in, got a surgery. Sanford MMA and it was done you know so they have their own doctors and everything so it's a state-of-the-art facility and I believe that that's going to be the new wave of MMA you know those these big gyms that have everything yeah one-stop shop that is so true and for you I was looking at my last question is I was looking about your background prior to MMA and you were a competitive cheerleader as well as an accomplished amateur wrestler and I'm just your thoughts on competitive cheerleading as a sport? Yeah, I wish I was still in it. Uh, man, competitive cheerleading, I'll, I'll tell everybody, that was when I was like 17, 18, man. We got to hang out with girls all the time, so we were like little rock stars. <laughs> it was fun. But um, I came into wrestling with a really strong core. That's, you know, kind of what it helps with uh, the sport of cheerleading, you know, tossing girls up and doing a lot of flips and stuff like that. So, yeah, that was definitely a fun time in my life. Well, I know I said last question, just real quick. 
I'm curious then, we could have saw you on Saturday afternoons on the sidelines of the big football games then, right? No, 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 we did more of the stuff that was on ESPN, like the competitive, like UCA. I know, I think competitive chilling is pretty big in Florida. They have a team uh, called Top Gun. They were popular whenever, about 2002, back then. They were out of Miami, so. And you're right, because in Orlando, they always would have the national championships for the competitive cheerleading every year over by Disney. Yes. Right. Listen, all the best. Thank you so much. Keep doing your thing with Sanford MMA as well. Thank you. We'll take our next questions from Ryan McCarthy with Low Kick MMA. Your line is open. Hey, Derek, can you hear me all right? Yes, I hear you. Good, good. How's it going, man? Um, just a couple questions here. I mean, um, you're in a, a pretty chaotic middleweight division here, so... Um, you know, the, is there a certain name, um, that, that comes to mind if you were to win on Saturday or anything like that? No, I'm just focusing, just th things are changing so much in this weight class, you know, like this is the best weight class in the UFC, the most exciting, a lot of stars, you know, um, so yeah, things are changing. So it's, it's, it's better to just focus on the one fight and then right after that, you can get to the next fight, you know? So like, yeah, just focus on this fight first. For sure, for sure. And and how do you see uh, Saturday's fight with Kevin going? Do you do you expect to do you expect to finish? Do you expect the full five rounds? What are you thinking? I expect to finish. You know, I'm gonna take my time, set things up. If he want to come early, you know, uh, I got something for that too. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna take my time and look look to get the finish and get the win. However, we get it. For sure. And uh, any specific cheat meal you get after after a W on Saturday? I don't know. Some cookies, some insomnia cookies. That'd be great. <laughs> Love it, love it. Um, well, best of luck, man. Appreciate it, and uh, best of luck on Saturday, man. Thank you. And we'll take our final questions from Pablo Santa Maria with Noti MMA Ecuador. Your line is open. Hi, Derek. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The first thing I want to ask you is: you're fighting in the small octagon. Do you think that uh, will give you an extra advantage because you are a wrestler? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, octagon is octagon, fighting anywhere, you know. You got, sorry, I got hiccups. But um, you have to get in, you have to work your way in, you have to be smart, be patient, um, set, th set things up. So big, big octagon, small octagon, I'm just going to do my thing regardless, you know. I'm not really, I mean, I know I came in as a wrestler, but I'm looking to just go out and get the job done with the hands are with the wrestling. For sure. Uh, this is your second fight in, on the pandemic, so... Do you expect to be more active in this year? Yeah, for sure. You know, definitely want to stay active, get as many fights as I can, and um, really keep working my way down towards the title shot. Okay, and what are your thoughts of Kevin Holland as, and as an opponent? I think Kevin Holland is a guy who likes to talk. He's rangy, he's long, he comes to get it. He's, he's aggressive, and um, he's breakable, you know? So we're going to get him to that breaking point and um, get the job done. Uh, for a long time, you uh, have are the gatekeeper in this division you're fighting uh, the young and uh, up commerce fighters so uh, are you okay with that uh, fighting and proving that they are just a uh, hype train well i mean i don't know um if i'm in this i'm in this position where um i was asking for the number two guy for this fight and the guy didn't want to fight you know he kind of didn't he turned down the fight so it, no it wasn't really anybody else available so Kevin Hollis was the fight that was offered, so we took it. You know, in this fight game, you got to fight. It's either wait or fight. And it's a thing of being active or not active. So we took the fight just so, you know, we stay active. And it's a fight that we can get up for, we can get excited about. It's a lot of hype on the fight, and that's where we're at. You know, I don't, I don't really play into the gatekeeper or anything like that. I don't even know what that really means. But I guess that's a nice way of saying you stay relevant all these years, so. For sure. Uh this division is very stacked. You can fight a lot of good fighters. Uh, a lot. There is a lot of fighters with a lot of hype, a lot of fans. So if you get the victory, uh, who would you like to face next? Um, I don't know. I'll probably figure that out right after I get the win. So, yeah, we just focus on this fight, locked in on this fight, and then we'll f figure out everything afterwards. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Derek, and good luck on the fight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. You're all set. Thanks. This concludes today's UFC Fight Night Brunson versus Holland Virtual Media Day. Video recordings will be sent out later today.
UFC Fight Night Brunson versus Holland takes place Saturday, March 20th from UFC Apex in Las Vegas. The main card will begin live on ESPN and ESPN Plus at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Thank you for joining, and you may disconnect.